Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great love that you've shown to us in Jesus Christ, uh, the amazing gospel that you have given to us. Let us experience your grace so that it overflows in us, uh, so that many may be able to know and experience your love through us. Uh, give us wisdom, give us courage, give us faith to follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, if you die today, do you know where you can go? Cemetery? After that. I mean the afterlife. Guess not. Well, the Bible says that all men have fallen short, but you can still be saved if you burn up your wicked slaves. <laughs> burn up your wicked wings, you idiot. You're an idiot. <laughs> You're not an idiot. Jesus loves you, but if you fuss with your spouse, you pretty with pop tarts. Believe in your heart. Look, tell them all the sins will be forgiven. Your sins will be forgiven. If it works through my coffee, God, could forgive me of my sins? Can you believe that? No way. What's the point of a pelican? I find those sins so bad that he can't forgive. That's my mind. That's a big blow, too. <laughs> now you could share the gospel without the inconvenient hassle of actually learning it yourself. Hello, don't. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so that's how not to do it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so before we get into methodology, um, this the beginning part of this is going to be pretty obvious, but I want to hit on it anyway because I think it's important to the rest of it. And that is, why do we do it? Why do we want to share the gospel with people? All right. And so the first answer is eternal life. We have this amazing gift. And I, I was... Um, Use the illustration if if you could if you had a cure for cancer, that could be they could just use you know simple tap water and apply it in just the right way and, and it would wipe out cancer. You'd want to share that with everyone. You'd want to get the word out. You'd want everybody to know that. And we have actually something better than that. Um, and this is actually from our uh, our gospel lesson from this morning, in John chapter three. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world, that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. All right? God has given us eternal life in Jesus Christ. This is a gift. We have not just a cure for cancer, but literally a cure for death. All right? And of course, we want everybody to have that. I mean, who would you not, in fact... Um, uh, Pen, Pen Gillette, uh from the duo Penn and Teller. Uh, you may be familiar with. They have a Vegas magic act. All right. Uh, Penn Gillette is also a very outspoken, famous atheist. All right. And um, and he said something to the effect of, and I forgot to grab the the exact quote, but is that anyone who is a Christian that believes um, everything that the Christianity teaches, if they don't want to convince me to believe in Jesus then they must really hate me, right? And this is a guy that does not speak well of Christianity. But he's saying, look, if you're a Christian and you say that you're not interested in, in bringing people to faith in Christ, how terrible are you, right? And, um, and I always, anytime someone who's not a Christian calls Christians on the carpet, <laughs> it, it, I think it's a wake-up call for us, right? Um, but I... The thing is, I also believe that, that most Christians want to share their faith and, and just need help doing it. And, and of course, that's why we're here today. Um, the other reason is, and I talked about this this morning in my sermon, is freedom. All right? That we are set free, <clears throat> that, that we have eternal life, but it's not just someday we have it today. That, um, that in Christ, we, um, we don't need to worry, we don't need to fear, we don't need to, uh, all of the, the stresses that we take on ourselves are unnecessary. Um, St. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, all those who are led by God's spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I told my confirmation class this week, I said, all right, if you had a bunch of green berets or Navy SEALs or, or you know, take your pick, all right, they were constantly fully armed, 
armored surrounding you everywhere you went, would you feel secure? Yeah, yeah, I'd feel pretty safe then, you know? All right? So we have a God who not only has surrounded us with legions of angels, all right, people talk about a guardian angel. I believe that that should never be used singularly, right? Um, that, that God has multiple angels watching over us, and um, but and who are way more powerful and have a whole lot more experience than any military specialist, right? Not only that, um, God Himself is watching out for us, right? And I said, okay, so if you, um, you know, if if you your family were billionaires, would you worry about money? Would you worry about having the things that you need? No. Okay, well, we are children of the Heavenly Father who created all things. Everything is His. And He's promised to give us everything that we need. All right, so why would we worry about anything? All right, and so, um, so because we have that freedom, because we are not slaves to, um, to all the things that this world tries to enslave us by, then... And we, and we are able to give that. It's not like God's resources are limited. You know, sometimes there's these, uh, there's like these contests where if you, um, you, know, you, you, you sign up, you, you, uh, post something on social media or something like that and you get sign up. And if you pass it on to other people, then you get additional entries, but then they get entered in. And so your chances of, of winning decrease. All right. Well, the great thing about the kingdom of God is that doesn't happen. It's it's for everyone. You don't lose out if you share it with anyone. If anything, it gets better. All right. And so we don't have to worry about that. All right. And so we got these great gifts to share. And and I mean, there's more. I could go on all day, as you probably know. Um, but there are things that get in the way. There are, there are fears. There are concerns uh, that we have. Qualified people. Take a closer look. Moses was not a great speaker. Jonah ran from God. Jacob was a liar. Noah got drunk. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair. Jeremiah was depressed. A lot. Solomon was rich in wisdom, but poor in lifestyle. John the Baptist was just plain poor. Timothy was too young. Abraham was too old. Lazarus was dead. Sarah was barren. Naomi was a widow. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. And so did Sarah. Peter lacked self-control. James and John were self-righteous. Paul had a short fuse. Well, so did Peter and Moses. Actually, lots of people did. God's army isn't perfect. It never has been. It's the march of the unqualified. Get in line. We can fear that, that somehow we're not qualified, that, that we don't have what it takes to share the gospel with people. Um, and you know, Moses, when God called him from the burning bush, right, he singled him out, called him and said, you, Moses. Right? And Moses says, I'm not a good speaker. Right? Um, Jeremiah he said, no, I'm not qualified. I'm too young, God. The apostles, they were they were busy with um, with all kinds of other things, and and I mean this was even after Pentecost, and, and finally they said, "Wait, we need to have somebody else taking care of some of this other uh, stuff, taking care of the widows and, and things like that, so that we can preach." Um, but they were they were too busy before that. All right, um, what are some other reasons that people might feel unqualified? Maybe you don't get your knowledge of the Bible is strong enough where you can 
get a good argument or persuade people. All right. Yeah. Just, just not enough knowledge. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, the whole testimony thing, all right, that having the, the right words to say, all right, yeah, anyone else? Don't look like you live it. What? Oh, you don't look like you live it, all right? Yeah, yeah, people, oh, well, you're a hypocrite, all right? Anything else? Um, you're, you're preaching, um, uh, Culture what America is today. Yeah, yeah, you're, how is this going to be received? If, if I say this stuff, man, the backlash, all right, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, well, they, they don't like Christians, so, yeah, why would, why, if I tell them they're just, you know, I'm going to lose my friendship, Okay. The fact that people call it spirituality religion, and they the, the difference is the uh, response of I'm spiritual, therefore I don't need this. Yep. Yeah, I have my own spirituality. All right. Don't don't push your stuff on me. All right. Yep. Anything else? Not politically What's that? Oh, not politically correct. When my Granddaughter graduated from college last week. The officiating clergy person started prayer with all great spirit and all by name names. In other words, uh-huh. <laughs> Emily looked around and she said, Granny, I looked around to see if you got up and left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I've seen that on multiple occasions. Uh huh. Yeah. I'll flip it around and say, not want to be lumped in with the people that, that while it's not being fully correct, but also, you guys use Christ in a way, use religion in a way that I'm not comfortable with. Right, right. Like when someone, when, when Christians are in the news and you go, I'm not with them. <laughs> right. No, that's not me. Right? Yeah. And so a fear of, of being, as soon as people find out you're a Christian, oh, you're one of them. All right. Good. Anything else? All right. Yeah. I will try to address every one of those today. All right. We'll see how we do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so for me, um, I, I dealt with a lot of those, those questions myself. All right. I've dealt with those uh, both as a Christian and as a pastor, which is kind of a whole another thing on top of that. All right. Um, when, when God called me to be a pastor, he sent all kinds of people into my life. All kinds of completely disconnected, unrelated people. Some were church people, some were not church people. that all told me you should be a pastor. And I had this picture in my head of what pastors are like. And the funny thing is, it, it actually wasn't... The picture in my head was not my pastor. <laughs> um, I, I, just, I had this sort of stereotype, uh, like, you know, you know who Ned Flanders is? Right? That was the picture that I had in my head. Okay. And I'm like, I'm not that guy. And, um, and, and yet God used all kinds of things to, it, to, until it got to the point where I said, all right, I better answer this call or avoid large bodies of water. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I've never regretted it. Never once. I've often questioned why, but I've never regretted it. All right. <laughs> Even when I graduated seminary, I wasn't the only one asking why. All right, because um, one of the, the placement advisors and that um, before I graduated, the, they're one of the people in charge of evaluating people said, um, well, you know, um, so what do you what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? I said, well, I like comic books and, uh, you know, and, and uh, anything sort of superhero or science fiction, fantasy. I like playing Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, yeah. Um, so. You need to be able to connect with, you know, with, with normal people. And, um, I mean, he may not have used those exact words, but that's what he was saying. And, uh, and he actually was suggesting that I take some extra classes just to learn how to, you know, connect with, with people and, and stuff and, um, before I graduated. And, 
Um, and, and I said, well, I'll tell you what, how about if I read a bunch of like, you know, historical fiction no uh, novels or, or something like that, you know, stuff about normal people. They said, all right, fine. Good. <laughs> I never did. All right. They didn't check on me. Um, and ironically, in the past three years, the top 10 grossing movies each year, 23 out of 30 of them were science fiction and fantasy movies. Eight of them were about superheroes. Ha. I'm normal. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, uh, God's call was just ahead of the time of everyone else. All right. Um, they didn't see it coming. God did. And, um, and in fact, now our, our youth group, most of the kids in there are, are really into... Uh, uh, not just fantasy, science fiction, but role playing games and all that. And they've been begging me to um, to start a Dungeons and Dragons uh, thing or something like that. And I'm still debating about whether or not that's uh, whether that's going to work with our group and stuff like that. But I mean, the point is that that here's here's kids that specifically need what God has made me to be. All right, and um, and I found that to be helpful many many times. So. Um, and so I realized over time that God called me to be me, not somebody else. Right? And God has called each one of you to be you and not somebody else. Right? And I'll tell you, there's still a lot of pressure to be that pastor, to be that, that stereotype pastor. All right? Um, not so much here. At St. James, but um, but sort of in the the greater uh, Lutheran world or Christian world, whatever you want to call it, All right? Um, but I, I need to be constantly reminding myself: No, God called me to be me. It doesn't mean I embrace sin or anything like that. All right, I've got plenty of things to go. Yep, that's me. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. Okay, um, but but God has given us each unique personalities. He's given us unique interests. He's given us, he's put us in certain places at a certain time for a purpose. All right? And if he didn't want you to be you, he'd have put somebody else there. So if you're there, if you are where you are, then you are where you're supposed to be. All right. So we have different spheres of influence, each one of us. All right? And so... What I'd like to do is to, to stop and, and just talk to the people at your table, all right? Um, you guys can move up or you can stay back there. I don't care. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but I'd like you to just take a couple minutes to talk about um, who are the people in your life, all right? There's people that are close to you. There's people that, are, that you barely know or maybe even don't know. All right. So we're talking everyone from the um, from like people that you live with to um, uh, the bank teller. OK, just take a moment and, and see just how many you don't have to write them down, but just, you know, throw some ideas at each other and see how many you can come up with. I'm going to transition you into another question. Maybe this one should have come first now that I think about it. And so, like, but where do you go that there are people? <laughs> and a really broad question, right? Right? But just think about how many different places that you go that there are people. Like, maybe I'll even say people that you interact with on some level. It's related. <laughs> just think places in it. All right, so we already saw a great uh, kind of funny example of, of how not to, all right? Um, this is a, a tweet that I saw a uh, week or so ago. What I think when a stranger knocks on my front door, I hope I don't get murdered. <laughs> what I will never think, I'd sure like to buy something, <laughs> all right? Um, and, and, I would, and I saw that, and I thought what I will never think is also... Um, boy, I would like some random stranger to tell me what he thinks about the secrets of the universe and then totally buy into that. All right. Um, and so there's been a lot of different sort of formula systems um, that have been used for, and maybe some of you have done door-to-door -door evangelism like me. Anyone like to, have, have you done that? Have you, have you ever used, right? Um, evangelism Explosion, this is probably the most well-known one. Came out in, what, the 60s, I think? Um, 
and it was uh, you probably heard the 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 Kennedy question, all right? Ken, uh, D. James Kennedy was the guy that, that invented it, all right? If you died tonight, all right, and God said, "Why should I let you into heaven?" How would you answer? All right. So we had um, when when I was at seminary, we had uh, DE two, which is Dialogue Evangelism two, which is basically like like they took evangelism explosion and like filtered it through Lutheranism. But it was basically the same thing. It was a different question, but it was the same question. Right? <clears throat> and we used it. We we went door to door and um and and in fact I, I kind of felt like I had this down, there was this outline that you follow. And I figured, boy, I've got this outline memorized and I can follow this. And um man, I felt like an expert. And then uh, when I was at my second church and we talked about doing some door to door kind of stuff and, and one of the, um, and, and one of the my members of my evangelism committee said, well, what if instead of following a formula, we just like talk to people? And I went, oh, no, no, that's, <laughs> that would never work. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's, it's a lot easier when you've got this, this formula to follow. All right. Um, and, and there was a time when that worked, all right? Um, not so much today. It's really easy when we talk to people that are not Christians to focus on works, to focus on their actions, to focus on um, how, they're, um, how they live, right? And a lot of the problems that we run into when it comes to talking to people whose um, whose beliefs are different from ours, whose lifestyles are different from ours, um, you know, even whose politics that are dictated by their worldview are different, right? Can cause a lot of conflict. But the problem is, is, is a lot of those situations. The problem is, is we're focusing on their works. We're focusing on the effect of what they believe instead of what they believe. And we'll come back to that. Right? Um, well, or, I'm sorry. We'll come to it right now. Right? We have a tendency to think, behave, believe, belong. Right? That, that once you're acting like a Christian, you're living a good Christian life. Right? Once you get all those, whatever sins are going on in your life out of the way, then, um, then you'll come to believe, all right? And once you believe what we believe, then you can belong, all right? This is actually the great example of this goes back to when the, um, when the Europeans first came over and, and brought the gospel to the various Native uh, Americans that were over here, uh, both in North and South America and Central America. And, um, and they would go, okay, so here's <clears throat> guns, and copper pots, and, uh, you know, we're going to teach you English, all right, or whatever the language was, the, all right, and once you, once you adopt our lifestyle, then we'll tell you about Jesus. And, and consequently, we still have the problem to this day that Christianity is tied into so often Western culture, which is weird because it didn't start in the West. All right, it started, Israel is not the West. And yet it's so closely linked in our culture that, that we think that, that you've got to act like an American in order to believe, right? Or to, in order to be a real Christian, right? Or we'll maybe swap it up a little bit and say, well, okay, you've got to believe, and that will change your behavior, that once you once you believe and you understand why we act the way we act, then you can belong. You can be one of us, All right? And so, but either one is really still focused on you can only be one of us if your behavior, if you're a good Christian. Um, no, this is this is here because it's too easy. Divisive confrontation. All right. This is what we were talking about with um, uh, people that are who who see things differently from us. All right. And um, 
And it's, I mean, like if, if you want to see what it looks like, go on Facebook and look pretty much anywhere where people are talking politics. Right. And it's divisive and um, and it's very rare to be able to have an intelligent conversation without people starting to, to, you know, act like monkeys and start throwing poo at each other. Right. And so um, and, you know, this this whole mentality you have with the behave, believe, belong. Right. In Luke chapter seven, where the, the woman comes in and, and she washes Jesus's. Uh, feet with her hair and with her tears, right? And the Pharisee, when he invited him, saw this, he said to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner, right? And there's no indication in the text that her lifestyle changed, right? She may well have come from a job straight to Jesus because she wasn't happy with her lifestyle, but that's where she was at. Right, with uh, and 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 she may well have even felt trapped in it. But saw Jesus as freedom. All right, and believe, behave, belong. When they come together, they asked him, "Lord, at this time, are you restoring the kingdom unto Israel?" The disciples coming to Jesus. That's from Acts chapter one. This is after the resurrection. Jesus' disciples, who had been with him for three years, are going, all right, so now are you establishing your earthly kingdom? They still didn't believe. They still didn't get it. And yet, Jesus called them his own. They belonged to him. Right? Another trap we fall into immediate expectation. If I say just the right words or do just the right thing, then boom, this person is going to come to faith. A great story of Bill Hybels, the founder of the Willow Creek Church down in um, in, uh, Chicago, Um, one of the biggest churches in the country, and really the the whole church growth movement, um, he was a huge part of that and stuff. Um, He he likes to tell this story about uh, his neighbor, who um, neighbor knew he was a pastor, didn't want anything to do with him, all right? But he talked to him. He talked to him, talked to him, talked to him. And, um, th- and this went on for like, I don't know, it was like 10 years, all right? And they developed a friendship and stuff and that. And, and you know, and, and when the opportunity came, he'd share the gospel with them and, and stuff. But the guy really wanted, you know, not interested, but I appreciate your friendship, you know? And then one day, this guy, his neighbor, he's at Willow Creek, came to see Bill Havels about something, all right? And he's walking through the hallway and runs into one of the other staff members. And, uh, and they start up a conversation. The, the staff member, the conversation leads to the gospel. He shares the gospel with him, and the guy comes to faith. And Bill goes, I worked on him for 10 years. <laughs> Nothing. You come along, you have one conversation with him, you never met him before, and boom. <laughs> and, and now the guy's, you know, really heavily involved in, in all this kind of stuff. And, but the point is that, that sometimes when we share the gospel with people, you know, we're, I've got a, an apple up in my office, a styrofoam apple that was given to me uh, at my ordination. Um, and, uh, and in fact, this is really appropriate. Today is Johnny Appleseed Day. All right, Johnny Appleseed went around and he planted seeds. And that was the point. That's why I have this apple uh, in my office. All right. He went around and planted seeds. He did not know how many of those seeds would take root and bear fruit. All right. A lot of them did. A lot of them didn't. All right. But he planted them anyway. And he just went around planting seeds. All right, and we also have uh, where uh, where Paul talks about one person waters, one person plants, you know, another produces the fruit. All right, and so our job, and we'll come back to this too, but our job is not to bring people to faith. <clears throat> our job is to share the gospel and show the love of Jesus. And, and you don't know how God is going to use someone. 
and I'll, I'll have some examples of that later. All right. <clears throat> so, how to do it. All right, first thing, personal spiritual growth. <coughs> Peter tells us, always be ready to give an answer for the, uh, for the reason, for the hope that's within you to those who ask. All right? Well, so the first thing, and this is addressed uh, one of the concerns before about don't know what to say. All right? Well, that starts with spiritual growth, with being in God's Word, um, with, uh, with, with growing in your faith and, and, and getting to know Jesus more. All right? The, better, the more you, you do that, the better equipped that you're going to be to do it. Okay? And, um, and by the way, Nobody has all the knowledge, right? I, I know coming here to St. James, especially where. Um, so, anybody here watch The Big Bang Theory? Okay, so there's this the, the four main characters. Three of them are PhDs, and one of them is not. He's an engineer. All right, and I came here, and it's Doctor Pastor Stadler, Doctor Pastor Oliver, Doctor Pastor Rocky, and then me. It's like Doctor, 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 Mister. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Reverend Doctor, Reverend Doctor, Reverend Doctor, Reverend. All right, um, and and I'll say whenever whenever there's something that I know that that one of the other pastors doesn't know, I'm like, oh, hey, <laughs> and uh, and Pastor Albrecht said to me something um, I don't know a year or so ago. Um, I mentioned that to him, and he says, "Yeah, I've, I've come to the conclusion that uh, I'm not gonna know everything before I get to heaven." Um, that there's just, there's so much there. None of us can know it all. Right. And, um, and, and that's, that's encouraging to me because I know that nobody knows it all. And so I don't need to know it all. Right. And so, so I don't need to worry about that. But God has given us some stuff <clears throat> to help us out with that. All right. He's given us his love. He's given us compassion. And you know what? In a world that with, with social media where, where people are more connected than ever and yet so lonely and isolated, man, do people need love and compassion. And you know what? That right there, that is the number one way to show the gospel. It's just by loving people. Just by showing compassion. Uh, Ephesians 4, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. The more we know God's love, the more we're able to show that love to others. You know, our our youth group, the Wednesday nights, we've got oh, probably, I think it's over half the kids now that come are not members of our congregation. All right? And a lot of them are kids that have been kicked out of other churches or have no church experience, or even <laughs> can't come if they don't take their anxiety meds because just the thought of church gives them literally a, a clinical anxiety attack because of bad experiences they've had. And yet, they come here. And, uh, and that behave, believe, belong thing, yeah, a lot of them, they're not there with the believing yet. But they know they're accepted here. And they've never experienced church like that before. And they feel like they belong. And we welcome them regardless where they're at in their lives. Regardless what their lives look like. Regardless what stuff is going on in the way they see the world or anything else. Why? Because we love them. Because we're compassionate. And they came here, they found out about this because one of the other kids who is a member here showed them compassion and accepted them where they're at and loves them for who they are and said, hey, you know, we do this thing on Wednesday nights. Why don't you come check it out? It's a lot of fun. And they come here and they're welcome. And they go, really? And we have one time we were out we were canoeing over at the Thunes house and, and then uh, walked back to, to church. And one of the kids goes, come on, we're going back to church. I cannot believe, I, I never 
imagine myself saying that. Right? So God has given us gifts where this works out and um, to use, and that is the fruit of the Spirit. Right? And you have them listed on your sheet. By the way, the, the, the handouts that I gave you, um, they're not, they, they follow roughly the outline of, of what I'm going through. Um, but I wanted, I used questions to try to help you think about how this applies to you. Um, and so, so you feel free to, you know, take notes however you want or whatever. Um, there's no quiz at the end. And, uh, but I, I wanted you to be able to kind of think this stuff through and you can see, so you can do it now, you can do it afterward, whatever. Um, to, but just to kind of help you think, how does all of this stuff apply to my life? And, um, <clears throat> When I when I look at the fruit of the spirit, some people take these things as uh, as law, as well. Like these are the things that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to love, and you're supposed to um, you're supposed to be hopeful, and you're supposed to be joyful, and you're supposed to have peace. Because right? <laughs> you can't you can't love out of obligation. You can love out of commitment, which can sometimes look like obligation. All right, but you can't love out of obligation. All right, you can't have joy <laughs> when when Paul says, um, "Rejoice in the Lord always." Again, I say rejoice. I was I was think I imagine that it's one of those things where people go, "Wait, always?" Yeah. <laughs> Again, I say rejoice. All right, but there's a reason for that. Not like, oh, you're not being joyful enough. All right, or or that passage, "The Lord loves a cheerful giver." You better be cheerful when you give. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I put on my, my Lee Press on smile. And um and no. We have these things. We have love because of the love that we know in Christ. We have joy because we have eternal life, because we have God with us wherever we go. We have peace because we know that whatever conflict is in our lives that God has already resolved it. He's already solved it, and it's just a matter of, of waiting to see the fulfillment. Right? Every one of those things that are listed as the fruit of the Spirit is called the fruit of the Spirit because this is what faith produces. The Holy Spirit gives us faith, and faith produces these things. When we know the salvation that we have in Christ, every one of those things is produced. Now, because we're sinners, they're not produced perfectly. But God has given us those gifts, right? And so I encourage you to, to look at those and, and think, all right, why do I have this thing? Why do I have love? Why do I have peace? Why do I have joy and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, right? Why do I have those things? Why, what is it about Christ that gives me that, Right? And those are the things that we can share with other people, right? That when there's another school shooting, and we can have hope in spite of it, when we can have joy, not that it happened, but knowing that, that this, when everyone is saying, I, I don't, you know, well, maybe this is the answer, maybe this is the answer, and we can say, you know what? There's there's lots of solutions to to explore ways to deal with this, all right? And we should do that. We should you know look at those and, and and try to find solutions. But at the same time, even in the midst of that, that we can have joy knowing that this is in God's hands, all right? And He loves every single victim. He loves the family, every single family member of those victims, and He loves the perpetrators. And when you look at it through that lens, it changes the way you look at it. And to be able to take that and respond in that way changes how we respond. And it causes people to say, what is up with you? Now, sometimes, sometimes they'll get mad about it. All right? I've seen situations where I've said, you know what, we, we need to respond in love to this. And people went, you're nuts. This is not about love. This is about revenge. No. No, it's not. Justice, yeah. All right? But even justice in love. 
And, and yet, you know what? People are going to get angry because the gospel is an offense. Right? We need to be aware of that. Right? And so what we're talking about this morning is, as uh, uh, Tom Moyer, the, the uh, former director of the Ongoing Ambassadors for Christ, one of my personal heroes, right? he said to me once, the gospel is always going to cause offense, but we don't have to be offensive in how we share it. And it's an important distinction, and it's really easy to be offensive. And then people get offended and go, oh, well, you're offended by the gospel. Like, no, I'm offended because you're acting like a jerk. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so, um, so the next, and then the next one, how to personal discipleship. This kind of ties in with personal spiritual growth. It's hard to fill from an empty bucket. Right? Um, there's uh, uh, some of the... Uh, Resources that I'll point you to at the end. Uh, one of the, the guys, a guy by the name of Mark, uh, I'm sorry, Mike Breen, um, who's, uh, he, in, uh, in, in Europe, Christianity is, you know, it's, it's a remnant, all right? Um, England is a perfect example of that. Uh, I'll give you a great example. There was a, a tour group going through and looking at some of these old cathedrals and stuff like that. And, uh, and they said, you know, here there's these tiles and there's 33 tiles. Uh, one for each of the years of Jesus' life. And one of the people in this tour group, this young woman in her 20s, said, wow, 33 years. He died young. What did he die of? And that gets back to that whole, you know, behave, believe, belong. Can you belong without knowing the facts? And um, so so Mike Green was a... Um, I think he was a pastor uh, at the time, and uh, and he saw the how um, the the church was just sort of languishing, and and so he started this uh, what's now today called the missional movement, right? Uh, with uh, missional communities where uh, people got together in small groups, they did Bible study together, and they went out and served their community, right? And um, and. And when he and he's been quoted, even though he's the the guy that started the missional movement, and and still I mean, I've I've seen him speak. He's just an amazing guy, and um, and another one of my personal heroes. And uh, and and he's been quoted as having saying, "The missional movement will die. It's doomed to failure." And you go, well, what are you doing? <laughs> All right, but the reason is, he said, if you get so focused on outreach, that you forget why you're doing it, that you're not growing yourself, you will deplete yourself. And people get burned out and used up, and they'll walk away. All right? You can't fill from an empty bucket. All right? And I can't emphasize this enough. It can be so easy. And I'll tell you, for me, as a pastor, this is easy for me, too. This is probably my biggest temptation. Is I can I can produce 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 if I don't take time on a regular basis daily to refill I get depleted and I know I'll get depleted and I know that, that if I do that that I cannot produce to the level that I want to and so I have to I have to do things in my life to hold myself accountable. To say, you know you need to do this, do it. Because it's so tempting to just get busy. Right? We get so busy serving that we forget that we need to be filled too. And it's not, it's not selfish to make sure that you're getting filled. It's, it's the same as on the, you know, the airplanes where they say, when the oxygen mask pop down, put yours on first and then get the one on your kids. And it seems so selfish. Like, no, I, I got to help my kid. No, no, no. You need oxygen to do what you need to do. All right, and that's all, like, if you look into that, it's a really fascinating study about the, how uh, loss of oxygen can very quickly change your ability to do anything. And, um, and so it is with the Word of God. All right. Um, more things. Um, when you see God at work, point him out. Um, recognize God working. Right? It's everywhere. Right? If from from the um, 
the, from the, the beginning of creation and then looking at the world and how, how everything is, um, is so fine tuned in, in the universe and everything that, um, you know, that we see how things had to come together in a certain way to, for us to be here today. All right. And, and people can chalk that up to coincidence. And I have friends that are atheists that, that chalk that up to coincidence. And, and I say, okay, yeah, but, when you start to look at the probability of, of these things happening, it's not just of these things happening, but happening at the right time and in the right place and, and all these things. And, and if one thing got, one cog got thrown into that machine, it would have thrown the whole thing off and none of it would have worked. I said, yeah, well, coincidences happen all the time. I said, the universe won the lottery, like the biggest, most unlikely lottery ever. Hundreds of times in a row at just the right time and never bought a ticket. Right? Look for that. But it's not just that stuff. Okay? Um, I told the evangelism committee last night that I was absolutely miserable. All right? My wife's been fighting a cold for the past, um, going on two weeks now and has been just really just barely, you know, struggling to make it. And, uh, and yesterday it hit me. <laughs> and, um, and I, oh no, <laughs> what am I going to do? And so I went and bought NyQuil and DayQuil and, um, <laughs> I said, all right, just get a soldier through. And, and, um, and then about seven o'clock last night, I'm better. Right. Um, I was praying, God, tomorrow's really important. I got to preach. I got to do this workshop, right? I, I need to be able to do this. And God said, okay. <laughs> Here you go. All right. Uh, I'll give you one more example of that just that I've seen in my life. All right. Sometimes it's miraculous. Sometimes it's not. Okay. And I could give you, I could go on all day with this. All right. This is one of my favorite stories because it involves one of my kids. All right. Um, right before Emma was born. Um, there was something I, to this day, do not know what it was, but I lost grip strength in my hands um, to the point that I could not squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube. I had no idea what was going on. I called the doctor, set up an appointment, and uh, but they couldn't get me in for a couple weeks. Meanwhile, uh, the uh, uh, Children's Services calls us up and said, It's a girl! <laughs> She was born yesterday. You can come get her tomorrow. Oh. Okay, then. Um, cool. <laughs> All right. So um, so it was time to go get Emma from the hospital and bring her home. And, um, and I'm sitting in my office that morning, and, and my wife uh, sends me a text and says, it's time to go. I said, all right. Somehow I need to get her car seat into the car. And I'm the only one in the family strong enough to really crank on it, to tighten up the seatbelt the way it needs to be. I said, I don't know, I'm going to do that. And she said, I don't know, but we got to figure something out. I said, well, I'll, I'll try. Maybe, maybe arm strength will, you know, work or something. And so, so I walked from my office to, to, the car was parsonage. The office is in the garage, and, and so um, I walked about thirty feet, all right, out to the car. Um, <clears throat> put the car seat in the car. Pop the seatbelt in, and pulled, and pulled, and pulled, and pulled, and got it tight so it wasn't moving. And I got out of the car. I said, "All right." It's all set. She says, how'd you do that? I don't know. My hands are fine. They weren't when I was sitting in my office trying to type at the keyboard. But in that 30 seconds that it took to walk out to my car, the strength came back. Oh, well, maybe it's adrenaline or something. No, because I know what adrenaline feels like. And it's not that I'm feeling really calm, which is weird, you know, given that we're about to go pick up a little girl and bring her home to adopt her and, <laughs> and, 
and never met her before or anything, you know. But um, but I, I was feeling really calm about the whole thing, and but it was just like, what is going on? And and um, drove, picked her up, got her buckled in, brought her home. Um, a few hours later, it went away again for like an hour, and then came back. And then and I've been fine ever since. Went to the doctor a couple weeks later when the appointment finally came about, and I said. And, and she says, so why are you here? I said, well, because I lost grip strength in my hands, but now it's back. She says, so why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, because I want to know if it's going to happen again. I want to know what caused it. And so she said, oh, it could be you know, a virus or it could be this or that or, or whatever. Ran some blood tests. Everything was pretty normal. And, and um, she said, I, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. And I said, so what, what caused it to... Not, like, I don't, at this point, I, I guess I don't care what caused it, but why did it come back at just the right time? It just At that moment, boom, it was totally back. It wasn't gradual. It was done. And then, and then went away for a little while. So it's not like if it was a virus, if I got over it and it was just, it was done and it ran its course, it wouldn't have come back for an hour later on. She says, yeah, I, I don't know. I said... In my line of work, we call that a miracle. <laughs> and she kind of brushed that off, right? Um, sometimes God works in amazing ways like that, right? Sometimes he works in very simple ways, right? We often call them coincidences, right? I, while I do believe there is such a thing as coincidence, right, I don't chalk everything up to, you know, to God, um, statistically, things are just going to happen sometimes. Um, but, well, I guess to quote Han Solo, good against the odds is one thing, good against the living is something else. All right? Um, and, uh, and he didn't mean it that way, but, um, you know what? Something, sometimes things happen where there's just the reasonable explanation is God intervening. Right? Don't be afraid of those. Right. Um, exercise. This isn't talking about physical exercise. This is talking about spiritual exercise. Right? This is this is talking about going out and using your faith. Right? It means that sometimes you're going to go out and you're going to take an opportunity when it presents itself to tell someone about Jesus or just to serve people selflessly. Right? And nothing's going to happen, or maybe there will even be a bad experience from it. But you exercised, right? And and our this is a skill just like any other skill. And when you use it, you get better at it. And when you exercise, you get depleted, and you need to be refilled, which gets us back to constantly going back to the Word. Right, and, but you'll find yourself when you're when you're out there when you find the opportunities to have those conversations and things with people that um, there will be times where someone's going to ask you a question you don't know the answer. It happens to me all the time. All right, don't be afraid of that. All right, the answer is I don't know, but I'll get back to you on that. That's a really interesting question. That's something I've never thought of before. All right, and for a guy who's seminary trained, you think that. I ought to have all the answers. I don't. All right? And people present me with, and I've, I mean, I've personally, I've, I've been up and down through doubt and all kinds of stuff like that, and probably am on a regular basis. All right? But every time I go back to God's Word and I come out stronger. And so, so the more exercise we get, the more we just go take the opportunity, right? The stronger we get, the better at it that we get. And so look for opportunities to love. Right? This is where it starts. Right? Don't just walk up to random people on the street and say, Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? All right? Um, you, people are just going to look at you weird, hold on to their wallets, and walk away. All right? But look for opportunities to love. To just to to follow and and to um and when someone needs help with something, as according to what your abilities are, recognizing that you can't do everything, be everywhere for everyone, right? I struggled with that for a while too. Well, I should 
I should be there. I should have been there for that person. I can't be in two places at once. Right? And I can't do everything. I can't do everything that I used to do. This morning, um, before the first service, Katie was sitting on my shoulders, and I was greeting people with her sitting on my shoulders. And when I finally took her off my shoulders, after about 10 minutes, my shoulders were sore. She's not that big, um, but I'm getting old, I guess. <laughs> like she keeps getting bigger, and I keep getting older, and so it's getting harder to do that, and there's going to come a day that I can't do that anymore. All right? And that's okay, because God's giving me other, other things in between. All right? You don't have to be someone you're not. Um, but when you have an opportunity to love someone, to go out of your way to help somebody, take that opportunity. All right? Um, one of the big reasons that the Christian church grew in the, um, in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, right, is because the plague came along. The plague was one of the best things that ever happened to the Christian church. Weird, huh? Because right? what would happen is, is the bubonic plague would come into uh, a city. Right? And so when that happened, everyone would move out. Everyone who's healthy would get out of there. And Christians would hang around. And people go, what are you doing? You're going to die if you stay here. Well, yeah, but you're going to die no matter what, and I need to help you. I need to be there for you and do what I can to help you. Right? And so a lot of Christians died. But some people survived. You know, what is it with you guys? What is it that you're willing to face death? That you're willing to go through this? And it was terrible. I mean, you read about Black Plague. It was terrible. What is it that you're willing to go through that? For me, when I'm probably going to die anyway. Well, because Jesus loves you. And Jesus loves me, and I don't have anything to worry about because I'm going to be in heaven, right? And so, meanwhile, I have the opportunity to serve you, and so I'm going to do that. And I'm going to love you, I'm going to be there for you, right? Now, that's an extreme example. Most of us probably won't find ourselves in a situation like that, right? But at the same time, we have opportunities to love that cause people to go, gee, um, thanks. That was really nice. Right? And, and for one, it's an opportunity to start building relationships. Right? That, that eventually you're going to get to that point where they say, all right, tell me what is up with you or, or what, what is it? Why do you go to church? And right? I've had kids say, I, I don't understand why you want to be a pastor. Right? And, and the, in that situation, it was, uh, because they're dealing with some kind of guilt or, or something like that and didn't really understand the gospel. I mean, how could you believe this stuff? How could you want to tell people about this? He said, well, if you, under, if you knew what I knew, what I know, and if you believe what I believe, you'd understand. Let me tell you. Um, and sometimes, sometimes you get the question right off the bat. That was really nice. Why, why would you do that for me? Right? But not usually. And that's okay. Right. Right. Pray. Pray with expectation. Um, James 1. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives to all generously and without criticizing, it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Right? Pray with expectation. Pray for the people. I, <laughs> I prayed to God, and, 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 you know, I still went out and bought um, NyQuil and DayQuil. All right? All right? But when, when the healing did come, I went, oh, this is great. I'm not totally surprised. Okay? Pray with expectation. Pray, God, use me. Um, kingdom praying. Uh, the kingdom of God, uh, we so often think of as heaven. Didn't help that when Matthew took the things that Jesus said, whenever he said, uh, 
the kingdom of God is like. In Matthew, it's the kingdom of heaven is like. That wasn't because he was just talking about the afterlife, right? It's because he was writing to Jews and, and um, keep using God's name over and over would cause a lot of offense. It'd be kind of like a pastor cussing during a sermon. Like, that's all people would hear. And they would completely miss the message. And so he just swapped out kingdom of heaven um, to give them uh, so they, they can get past that. Right? But when you look at Jesus' parables, every time he says the kingdom of God is like, all right, most of them, he's not talking about heaven. He's not talking about eternity. He's talking about today. Right? And so pray with the kingdom in mind. Pray recognizing God is with us. He loves us. He's going to take care of us. He is going to work through us and accomplish great things in spite of us even. <laughs> the, the days when, when I preach and, and I get done preaching and I just want to go into a closet somewhere and beg God for mercy, because I think that was terrible. Like, those are the days that people are like, Pastor, that was exactly what I needed to hear. <laughs> like, that's because God is good, not because of me. Right? Because God works in spite of us. All right? Don't give up. I told you the story about Bill Hybels and his friend. Ten years. All right? I've got friends that we've been friends for longer than that. All right? They're still not there. But I keep praying for them. And don't give up. Because I know, <laughs> some of them especially, I just think, God, boy, if you could... If you could bring that guy to faith, wow, he would be like, it'd be like Saul and Paul, and he would, man, he would be such a powerful witness for you. And in fact, this one guy especially comes to mind. Um, I, was, I was talking to him one day, and, and I mean, he's still nowhere near there, all right? He's not as hostile to Christianity as he used to be, all right? Um, but I also, uh, someone else joined in on the conversation on social media, a friend of mine who's a Christian, and um, and who's a, I mean, just a very, just a great uh, evangelist, apologist, and things for the faith. And um, and he says, that was me 20 years ago. Don't give up. He says, I, I, I love this guy and I love talking to him because that was me. I said, the things he says are the exact same things I said. So don't give up. All right. Make reminders. This is, this is off of my phone. It, it cuts it off. But I have every morning, a little reminder goes off on my phone. Pray for the opportunity to connect someone today to Christ's love. And I set that up to remind myself. Don't forget, today is God's day. And he's going to use it to his glory. And so, so for me, and, and some of you, maybe you don't need the reminder. Maybe you just have a better memory than me, right? Um, but me, I, I set up all kinds of reminders for myself um, to stop and to pray for specific things. I, I, every day I ask God, if, if there's some way that you're going to use me today, open my eyes to that. Let me see that opportunity. And give me courage to take hold of it. And give me love. So that my courage isn't wasted. Right? And, and I plead with God every day for that opportunity. And, and that I may show Christ. Um, so um, when we share the gospel listen first and second um, if you're here for Lent last year you may remember um, when we did the or no I'm sorry not Lent 
um, getting my series mixed up. When we started to be ready to give an answer, um, Bible study series, uh, Pastor Albrecht pointed out that you can't be ready to give an answer until you listen for the question. All right? You got to listen. You got to know where people are coming from and understand why they're at where they're at. And and we have a tendency when someone starts to ask a question that we get the answer in our heads. And then it's kind of like, all right, all right, all right, all right you're done. Okay, here's my answer. Don't do that. Listen. Listen to where they're at and where they're coming from. All right? And find out why. Um, my favorite professor from the seminary, his name is Bob Cole. Um, he's, uh, in fact, he, he's very heavily, highly respected um, in the Lutheran community. And in fact, one of the translations of the Book of Concord um, that we use was translated by him and somebody else. And the thing I loved about his class and I love about just him is that every time we ask him a question, he always answers the same way. Why do you want to know? Because the way that we answer depends on where they're coming from. Why are you asking that question? Right? Because if, you know, if someone is, um, well, I'll, I'll give you the example that, that, um, that he gave, which is a phenomenal example. He, was, he used to be a professor, um, I think he heard from Cody St. Paul, um, or else it was a Mac one, I forget. But anyway, he, um, he was teaching a, a class, and he was talking about suicide. And how it used to be that the people thought that, that if you commit suicide, then you just immediately go to hell, all right? And, and he was talking about how, you know, no, that's our faith, our salvation is not so tenuous as that. And, um, and, and he talked about that we're saved by grace, not that our actions, faith is a gift from God, and, and he produces it in us. And, and the class gets all done, and, and the student walked up to him and, and said, Professor, are you saying that if someone commits suicide, they won't go to hell? And he looked at the class and he said, and how did I answer? And we all said, why do you want to know? He said, uh, I knew why she was asking. I didn't have to ask why she wanted to know. Because I knew that she was struggling with depression. I knew what she was going on. I knew what was go- why she was asking. And so I told her, no, you do not commit suicide. Right? That is not something you want to do. Right? But he knew that because he had a relationship with her. Right, and so as you build relationships with people, you start to find out why. Right, but any time, especially if it's someone that you don't know well, asks you a question, especially something where the question may be somewhat divisive, or the answer may be, find out where they're coming from, find out why they want to know. Right, because it may be that they're really struggling with something, and if you just give them a textbook answer. It's going to destroy him because they really needed to hear the gospel and you just gave them the law. Or they needed to hear the law because they're really secure in their sin. And you just gave them the gospel. And for them, it, it, they took it as, as, well, sin doesn't matter. Well, no, sin is harmful in our lives. Okay? So find out why. Why do you want to know is a phenomenal question. Or uh, good question. Why do you ask? Right? It'd be so helpful. It's, it's one thing I really hate about um, uh, electronic media is it's a lot harder to have those kind of conversations. Uh, people tend to ask point blank questions and what's your position on this or that? Like, why do you ask? <laughs> you know? um, and, and a lot of times it's, it's harder to get there. Um, and there have been plenty of times where I know that I've answered with just as, as gently as I possibly could, um, but I know it wasn't received the way I intended it. That's going to happen too. Everyone gets misinterpreted. All right, don't be afraid of that. Don't feel bad about it. It's called humanity. We misinterpret each other. All right, um, need need. Find out what's going on. Find out what their struggle is. Especially when you have a situation where people will ask you a question, right? There's a need that drove that question, right? Or, or just you know, even before the question, 
when you find people, this goes back to just loving people and showing compassion. Meet the needs when you can, all right? Which will lead to the questions eventually as they find that they can trust you, as they find oh, this is somebody that, that I can come to, this is somebody that, um, that I, can, I can at least hear them out when I have a question and they might be able to help. Right. Respond to pain with love. When people are struggling, um, don't uh, don't be afraid to, uh, or you know, recognize the pain, recognize when they're hurting, and um, and do not respond to pain with condemnation. They need the gospel. If they're they're struggling with an issue of some kind, right? Um, they go, well, God says that's sin. I'm not, you know, I, I use the example of the lady that washed Jesus' feet with her hair, right? And usually it's, it's kind of assumed that she was a prostitute, right? But did she want to be in that position? We don't know. Based on what we know nowadays, probably not. And Jesus saw that, right? Matthew, the tax collector. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, right? They were, even though they had money and, you know, and, and all that, they were hated, right? They were in pain. And Jesus responded with love. And when Jesus told Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today, I'm going to eat with you, that was, that was like one step away from put a ring on it. Right? Because in that culture, you did not eat with somebody unless you were wanted to be thought of as affiliated with them. And people were deeply offended by that. Now, that's the other thing. You show love to some people, other people are going to be offended. That's the way it goes. Just love. And love the people that are offended, too. All right? I'll be a thank. All right, talked about this already. Hold on. That's supposed to blow up. Sorry, little friend. Is a little heavy handed, I, but it makes a point that oftentimes we can be afraid to just be who we are as Christians because we're afraid how people are going to react. Um, when I was in Ohio, 
uh, there was a um, I, I was I was looking for an opportunity to to connect with people outside the church. All right, and I'll come back to that later. But um, but I, so I, I I met these guys to uh, I found this group online that um, they got together on Saturdays to play one of my favorite role playing games, and, and I said, oh, you know, I'd love to, and and so I. Asked him if I could come and, and join him for the game, and you know they kind of advertised for more people, and, and so so yeah, I'd come and and you know we and we started playing and stuff, and everything was going great, and and so with these kind of games, it leads to other conversation. That, and then, so what do you do for a living? I hate that question. All right, because usually when I answer that question, everyone clams up. Especially when it was with a group. I mean, these guys, it was pretty clear that they weren't Christians. And I said, all right, I'll tell you, all right, but, like, just, I'm just a regular guy, and, and, and I don't want you to feel uncomfortable or weird or anything. And one of them goes, what, are you a stripper? <laughs> Okay, well, so nope, nope, nothing like that. <laughs> and uh, and I said, no, I'm a pastor. Oh, okay. And went on, had a great time. All right, now, schedule working out. I, I wasn't able to get back together with them. And I always felt bad about that because I felt like, I hope that they didn't feel like I didn't come back because I was judging them or something. I, I sent them a couple notes over time, and it was just Saturdays ended up not working out for me. But um but there was actually another time where uh, just recently I was over um, a few weeks ago at my cousin's house and um, and uh, we were playing a game and, and stuff and and then one of the guys went oh we were playing Cards Against Humanity which if you played it it's it's kind of raw and um, it's, it's not one that I really recommend as a pastor okay and um, and uh, so. But I was playing it because I was with these people, and that's what they were playing, and so I, I joined in on the game, and um, and and then one of the guys found out I was a pastor. He goes, "Oh, and like, and you know, you just kind of turn pale and stuff like that." And, and I just started cracking it up, but like, really, it's okay. And um, you know, and, and we had a great night and, and stuff, and um, and it was nice to make some connections, and I look forward to getting together with these people again, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, people, sometimes it works out great. It's sometimes it's a great evangelism tool for me, right? Because it depends on what a person's, uh, response is that it can lead to, um, you know, we were at a, uh, doctor appointment for one of my kids and, uh, and the, where there, the, the person knew that I was a, a pastor and, and, um, and, and, you know, she sort of, well, you guys are church people. And, and so, and it was it, like, it was a positive thing for her, right? So you never know. Now with you just as a Christian, right? Um, there's people are going to respond in different ways, right? Because they've got all kinds of preconceived notions, right? And so, so be you, don't be afraid to, um, to, to be you. If someone said, well, what did you do this weekend? Oh, it's church, you know? Right, because what it does is it, it it helps people to see, oh, you're a regular person. Um, when I was at uh, when I was in college before I went to seminary, I was a manager at Wendy's, and um, and I had like I wore this jean jacket that had a big cross in the back, and it said, "Exit Prince of Darkness, Enter Prince of Peace," you know, and and had a bunch of other Christian symbols on my jacket and stuff like that, which of course I didn't wear when I was working. Okay. But um, but I had one of the there was this conversation that, that came up and and um and someone said something to the effect of that I was a Christian and um and this other person that worked there that hadn't worked there very long went no you're not yeah I am and one of the other people that knew I was going to seminary like in a few months started cracking up and um and, 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 yeah he's gonna be a pastor no and I went, what? what hold on a minute. <laughs> What is it about me that makes you think there's no way he could be a Christian? And she said, because you're not pushy. Oh. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, and and I'm, I'm really sorry that that's the experience that you've had with Christians. Right? And yet we were able to have, after that, we were able to have different conversations and stuff like that. She knew who I was and where I was at. I was going to go be a pastor on that, but... 
because we worked together, she got to know me, right? And um, and and ended up feeling very comfortable around me, right? So don't be afraid to be who you are. Don't be afraid to be a Christian, right? But show people because people have all these preconceived notions of what Christians are like. Show them what Christ is like. Show them his love. Start, always start with love. Um, right. Ever wondered why Jesus' last command to his committed followers was to make disciples of all nations? Have you ever wondered what it would look like if Christ's most committed followers today actually carried forth that command according to the standards set forth in the New Testament by Christ in the Twelve? If an evangelist were to reach a thousand people a day for Christ in a frozen population, can you imagine how long it would take to reach the world for Jesus Christ? Just over 15,000 years. And imagine the spiritual maturity of these new converts, most of whom receive no real follow-up or discipleship and end up never reaching their full potential in Christ. However, if a committed follower of Christ, we'll call him Paul, were to disciple a new believer for one year, we'll call him Timothy, to the extent that Timothy matures in Christ until he is able to disciple another, for as Luke 6.40 says, the student will become like his teacher. So then, in year two, Timothy has become a disciple of himself and takes on his first student, while Paul takes on another student. By the third year, our Paul is discipling his third student, while our Timothy is discipling his second student, and our newest student is now able to make disciples as well. If the cycle is not broken, a spiritual downline is created which multiplies to the ends of the earth. Even at an accurate and growing population rate, do you know how long it would take in such a scenario to reach the entire world for Jesus Christ? Just under 37 years. And now imagine the spiritual maturity of these believers, all of whom have been equipped to both be and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. This is why Christ's last command of his followers is not to make converts, but to make disciples of all nations. Obviously, in that scenario, sometimes it takes more than a year, right? And sometimes this the chain gets broken, right? Um, but when you look at the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. First of all, understanding disciple doesn't mean classroom student. I was my, my favorite example of, of disciple to show uh, an, an example of what discipleship looks like is if you watch The Empire Strikes Back and you learn, you watch Luke learning under Yoda. All right. That's discipleship right there. That's the model that Jesus used. George Lucas stole it. All right. Well, actually, it's the apprenticeship model that's been used for ages. All right. And so, um, so make disciples, apprentices of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. <laughs> By the way, so the word there is observe, uh, keep, treasure. It's not obey, it's NIV translates as obey, all right? Teaching them to, to showing them the riches of the gospel. And showing them how the gospel plays out in our lives, getting back to the fruit of the Spirit, how that looks, and the joy that we have in it. Such that it flows from them into the lives of others. All right, that, that video, that, this whole concept is, I said before at the beginning that I questioned why God made me a pastor. All right, and the reason I question that is because for most of my life, and especially in high school and college, most of my friends weren't Christians. They knew I was. 
And I was okay with that. And it gave the opportunity for all kinds of conversations and opportunities to share the love of Christ with them. And then when God called me to be a pastor, I went, hold on a minute here. Why would I want to do that? Because if I do that, then I'm going to hang around with Christians all the time. Until I realized making disciples, this was over 10 years after I was a pastor that I finally figured this out, that I could reach so many people. God could use me to reach them, not that I'm brilliant, but that God is able to work through broken people, right? But I can only reach, you know, so many people in a given amount of time just hanging out with my friends that weren't Christians. Whereas if I could teach people to teach people, if I could train people to train people, if I could reach out that way, then, oh, all of a sudden it makes sense. All right? My kids have reached out to more people and, and brought them to church and, and seen them come to faith than I have. And that's awesome. Mission accomplished. <laughs> right? I mean, we've got kids coming to our youth group that, I mean, you know, I, it, all of a sudden I get one of my kids coming and show me this text. Dad, Dad, look at this, look at this. Look. And what it is, it's, it's a friend saying, hey, tell me, I, I need to know more about this Jesus thing. I think there's something to this. Not because of anything I've done. At the same time, because I made disciples of my kids. And, um, and they have so many connections already. And they're going out into the world and, and even choosing their career paths based on what is the best way that I can bring Jesus to the world. And um, so the Great Commission is to make disciples, not converts. Right? It can be really easy to um, to just okay. Well, that person came to faith. Now, check done. Got my merit badge. Whatever. All right? And you know that's one of the that's one of the assumptions that people have about Christians. Right? Make disciples means that we stay connected with them. Right? That we show them, you know, I, like when I was still trying to figure this out, like how do you make disciples? I went, I don't know how to do this. And then I went, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I do. Look at my kids. How do I do that? Oh, I live with them. <laughs> right? But there's actually something to that. Not necessarily that you have to share a mailbox. All right, but that you share your life with people, and and if 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 everyone is is able to connect, and, and God uses them to bring faith to you know one or two people, and then it goes out from there, and think what would happen. And and meanwhile, they're not disconnected. It's not like okay, well you're equipped now go. It's you still stay in community. You're still building each other up. You're still strengthening each other. You gotta meet people where they're at. Um, I already mentioned this, but we gotta start with belong, believe, behave. The kids that we have, um, a lot of the kids we have coming to youth group right now, uh, they're at the belong phase. They don't believe yet, but they're still coming. And we pray for them every day. Um, that's this bracelet right here. Alright? That's my reminder to pray for them, because I need those reminders. And, um, and, and I believe that they will eventually come to that point. That is my expectation when I pray. Right? And so eventually, their lives are going to change. The way that they live their lives is going to change as a result of their faith. But 
I'm not focusing on the, on the behavior first. Now, if they ask me what I think of this or that, I might say, well, I'm not sure that's what's best for you. All right? I, I, I can see that, that causing some pain and destruction in your life, and I want more for you than that. All right? But I'm not going to say, well, you're bad. You got to straighten up. All right? I'm not going to tell them God's angry with you. Mom, where's Timmy? He's gone to be with the Lord. He's dead? No, oh, silly. He and his family have moved to Bubble Creek Canyon. Do you dream of a day when you can drive to work without being forced to look at unchristian billboards and bumper stickers? When you can turn on the radio without hearing the electric guitar or some of the horrible instrument of the devil? When you don't have to interact with bozos who have the audacity to disagree with you? Well, at Bubble Creek Canyon, your dreams can come true. Hello. Or as we like to say at Bubble Creek Canyon, have it out. Bubble Creek Canyon is an isolated community nestled in 3,500 acres of magnificent and desirable real estate. Best of all, it's 100% heat and free. That's right, and you'll think it's the next best thing to have it. At Bubble Creek Canyon, we use an elaborate screening process to ensure that our residents completely agree with our doctrine. No oh, ifs, ands, or buddhists. <laughs> we have a gated community with fantastic facilities, breathtaking sight lines, and Christianized amenities. We have a Christian shoe store, a Christian t-shirt store, a Christian underwear store, a Christian bank, Christian grocery, Christian car dealership, Christian pet store, Christian liquor store, and a Christian tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> we have a nice <laughs> school district, <laughs> and one textbook. We also think you're going to like our library. Let this filth get in here. At the BCC Cinema, you can watch all the latest movies without talking about the questionable content because we removed it all. <laughs> I Every home comes with a spacious backyard with plenty of room for an optional baptism pool. Hey, pity you on the High Priest Soldier, one of my personal favorites. <laughs> and each home comes equipped with built in Christian signage. Just try to pull this off the wall. With our combination cable and internet package, you'll have access to ES Pray In, My Heavenly Space, God Tunes, Godpedia, God Gold, God Bay, Godcast, <laughs> and Sopranos. <laughs> Every morning, a copy of our community paper will be delivered to your doorstep. Our publication is committed to protecting you from all that unpalatable bad news that's always happening around the world. Praise our landscape and company, Holy Ground, will make sure that your front lawn is always impeccably manicured. We've added a new feature this year. Around the holidays, special sensors in the streetlights detect non-activity ornamentation and act quickly to eliminate these unsightly eyes for us. Bubble Creek Canyon, if God wasn't omnipresent, he'd probably live here. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was actually, you know, that, that kind of ties into um, my concern that I said about becoming a pastor. I want to hang around with people that aren't Christians. Um, and statistically, the, the longer someone is a Christian, the less non-Christian friends they have. We tend to hang around with people that are like us. Um, but... Uh, it was uh, Ed Stetzer, I believe. He was um, eyes with Lifeway now. I um, can't remember what his exact position is, uh, but he wrote one of the books that's on that list. Um, he said, and, and don't be offended by this, um, it was, if you want to reach the lost, you have to be willing to sit in the smoking section. Right? I'm not saying that if you smoke, you're not a Christian. Right? But rather, you need to be willing to go to places that you're not comfortable. Right? You can't just hang around with people that you totally agree with all the time. <clears throat> and and what will happen is that you'll have, I mean, that's where you have the opportunities. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. We had a foster son um, a few years back that um, he was 16, turned 17 while he was with us. I had a... Um, a group that I went to on Sunday nights, a uh, men's um, uh, called the Journey Group, and um, got together, read the Bible, talked about 
um, our faith and, and how it was affecting our lives. And um, and I and he wasn't a Christian. But I said, if you want to come, you can come. Why don't you try it once, see what you think, and if you don't if you don't like it, it's fine. He said, all right, fine. And nothing else to do. So he came. And it was, I mean, this is all grown men. I mean, I was, okay, I wasn't the youngest adult there, but I was probably in the middle as far as age goes. All right, the, the youngest was in his early 20s. And, um, and the next week he wanted to come back. And he kept wanting to come back. And is, it, is this because there's food there? Well, yeah, but I want to go. And it was to the point that we could actually go, all right, make sure you get your homework done if you want to go. Right, you can't go if you don't get your homework done. We were actually able to use a Bible study for a non-Christian kid to motivate him to do his homework. And he started inviting his friends from school. And his friends would ask him, you don't believe this stuff, why do you go? He said, because it's nice to belong to someone. I already talked about our Wednesday night youth group. Right? One of the kids, we were, we were sitting here eating beforehand. I, I wasn't sitting with him. I was doing some stuff, but I kind of overheard just a piece of the conversation. One of them talking to one of his friends that he had brought. All right, so we've got kids that are not... Christians or, or have no church connection that are bringing their friends here. And I heard him say, this is the best place ever. No lie. When I was in college, um, <clears throat> the group that I hung out with uh, was called RUSAP, the Royal Order of Strange Acting People. Um, it was, we got together on weekends and played role playing games, Dungeons and Dragons, stuff like that. And, um, and one day a bunch of guys were complaining about, oh, those BACs. Oh, oh, I can't stand it. Oh, mm. You know, and, uh, what are you guys talking about? What's a BAC? Oh, it's born again Christians. Hey, hold on a minute here. I'm a born again Christian. Well, yeah, but you're cool. Right? What are they saying? I welcomed them and accepted them. And I didn't, you know, they had all these preconceived notions. Right? But I met them where they were at. And didn't expect certain things before we could be friends. Um, I had a friend, she was actually ended up being the, she was the matron of honor at my wedding. Um, friend from high school that when, my wife and I started dating. They hit it off, and they ended up being better friends than she and I ever had been. And, um, <clears throat> but in high school, she wasn't a Christian. Um, she had had some pretty, uh, just really bad experiences with church, or mom used it as a punishment and things. And, um, and she said to me one time, you know, if I ever were a Christian, I'd want to be Lutheran. Okay, why? Because you are. And that's the kind of Christian that I want to be. That's the kind of, the God that you believe in is the kind of God that I want to believe in. Well, perfect example of somebody that, I mean, I knew her for years. And um, and then when I was at my second church, I got an email from her one day that said, "Did you baptize me?" Well, long story short, she met a guy who's a Christian, and he showed her the love of Christ. They ended up getting married. I didn't end up baptizing her, but she's a Sunday school teacher now, All right? And so I wasn't the one that, you know, that brought her over the line. But I showed her the love of Christ. I met her where she was at. And there were times where I got too pushy. 
And she pushed back. And she said, look, you got to respect me for where I'm at. You can't expect that I'm going to do what you want to do in order for us to be friends. I mean, she called me on the carpet a few times, and she was right. Thankfully, she was a very forgiving person, and we stayed friends. People where they're at. Um, remember, works aren't the goal. Freedom is. All right. It's just so easy to get hung up on the way people are living or how they believe is the right way to live. That we can't expect people to act like Christians unless they have a reason to act that way. And our goal is not to change their behavior. We are not Pharisees. Our goal is to set them free in Christ. That's what we want. Once they're free, then, you know, behavior stuff, lifestyle, all that kind of stuff, we'll deal with that when we get there, right? When they start asking questions. When they start saying, I want to live free. What does that look like? And then we can start talking about, well, you know, it seems like you're kind of enslaved by this or that. And it seems like that's driving a wedge between you and Jesus. Is that, is that thing, do you want that driving a wedge or do you want to be closer to Jesus? All right? But until they're there, until they're free, then it makes no sense. I mean, this kind of, people try to take, uh, the teachings of Jesus and, and say, well, he was a good teacher, right? But here's the thing. Jesus' teachings, when you really get down to it and you start looking at the teachings of Jesus, the problem with Jesus' teachings is they make no sense unless he rose from the dead. Because everything that Jesus taught about how to live is in the context of eternal life, Right? Why should I love my neighbor if I only go around once in the world? Then I should do what works best for me. Right? Otherwise, there, I have to come up with some way to justify otherwise. Right? And I know plenty of people that aren't Christians that are really nice to other people. All right? I'm not saying that's not the case. Okay? But to try to, to say this is the best way for you to act... This is the way that you should see the world without the promise of the resurrection, without the assurance that God is with us and, and that the kingdom of God is today and now. Then it just makes no sense. Show them the love of Jesus first. Don't, just don't worry about the works, lifestyle stuff. Right? There will be a time for that. And along with that, babies are not little adults. All right? Christianity is there's it's a maturity process. All right? And people go through phases. There's there's some great books on this. I don't have them listed here, but uh, I can I can point you to some stuff or some summaries that I've written. But faith is a is a maturing process. All right. Paul talks about milk and meat. All right. There's certain things that um, that we're just gonna really struggle with. That, that early Christians that, that have just come to faith, that they're going to have problems with it. They're not going to be ready for it yet. Now, when I say that, I need to clarify. When I was in high school, I dated a Mormon girl. And I would ask her questions about what she believed, and she'd say, you're not ready for that yet. Ask me anything. I'll tell you. I'm not ashamed of anything that I believe. What? Well, you're not ready for that yet. All right. That's how cults work. All right. When I say not ready for, there's certain things, there's certain conversations that they're going to go, I, I, no, I don't get that. Or, or just, you know, that their life, you know, there's still some things that they're enslaved to, right? Because we all have stuff that we're enslaved to, right? 
be patient with them and walk with them through that stuff and don't expect immediate results. Don't expect that all of a sudden they're going to, you know, it's a perfect example. The um, It's been said that the last part of a person to be converted is their wallet. Right? You, you can't just, when someone becomes a Christian, say, all right, now let's, let's sit down and take a look at your finances. No, it takes time. And in fact, any church that wants to do evangelism so that they get more money in the plate is, I mean, that's a really bad way to go. Because people that are, that are just coming to faith have the lowest giving rates. Because they're not there yet. They, they, haven't, they don't have the cheerful giver thing down yet. And uh, and unless you you do this like some churches do, where you have to turn in your tax return, and they compare it to your giving, yes, there are churches that do that. All right, um, and I mean that's just that's Phariseeism. <laughs> okay, um, but I mean people aren't always going to live the way that you expect to, and it's going to take time, um, in, for people to to mature in their faith. Right? And there's plenty of people that have been Christians for a very long time that still have some pretty significant hang-ups or even seem pretty immature faith-wise. Right? But also, don't be too quick to judge people. Maturity is more looking at yourself. Um, and, and it comes down to, you know, Jesus said, that on the one hand, you have this dichotomy. This took me a while to figure out. Jesus said that, uh, let the little children come to me of such is the kingdom of God like you need to be like that and then Paul turns around and says okay but you're not a child anymore well, which is it uh, it's the difference between childish and childlike childish is selfish childlike is being able to, to experience the awe and um and so what Jesus was talking about is to recognize the, the awe, the wonder, the, the beauty of God's love. All right? Um, but we can also be childish in our faith and be selfish. And it, it takes time to grow. Um, and so, and the other thing with discipleship, and this is the hardest one right here, is live sacrificially. Be ready to get messy. All right? It means that there are going to be times where it's inconvenient. It means that, that it is a long process. Right? It's very rare for someone to hear the gospel for the first time and just go, Oh! <laughs> and all of a sudden they're reciting the Nicene Creed. Okay? It takes time. And sometimes you get results you know, the result of faith that you're looking for, and sometimes you don't. But we don't treat people as objectives. We treat people as children of God that he dearly loves and wants in his family. And so we love them. The same way that, that when a, if, a, if a child turns away from the family or turns away from the faith, what do you do? You love them. You keep on loving them. You don't give up on them. And, and so we're not called to turn people even into Christians. We're called to love. Right. So, so what do you talk about? The kingdom of God. Right? Don't get bogged down into details. And if people ask um, questions about different things and how does this work or whatever, answer. Answer. Ask, why do you want to know? All right? Find out where they're coming from. Good answer. For the kingdom of God, this is something that a lot of people, when they think of Christianity, they think heaven. That's why, like, Emperor Constantine wasn't baptized until he wanted to be baptized on his deathbed. So that all his sins would be forgiven. Like Christianity is all about heaven. I mentioned that in my sermon this morning. Right? When we start talking about the kingdom of God, when you start talking about being able to put into life context when someone's struggling, 
to be able to say, um, you know, I'm going to pray for you. And, and, and by the way, I'll tell you, this is, this is something that um, is really amazing to me. A lot of people that are not Christians or not religious in any sense of the term, that you say, do you mind if I pray for you? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Right? And it may be that they're going, hey, pff, can't hurt. Right? But um, here's one. It, this is an exercise I didn't list it on here, but uh, something I encourage you to try. When you go out to eat, when your server comes to your table, um, you know, takes your order in that, something like this. So um, we're Christians and we pray before we eat. Is there anything that we could pray for you about? Right? Usually, that person will say, yeah, and they'll tell you something. Why? Because you just express concern for them as a person. And that's really rare in the server world. And by the way, tip well. <laughs> no, I mean, like, seriously, I, I, I know of a pastor that said, Christians in restaurants are almost the reason I didn't come to faith. Because he, he worked at a, at, a, at a restaurant on Sunday afternoons, and all the Christians would come in after church and were terrible tippers. You know, these people are awful. Why would I want to be like that? I mean, he's a pastor, but um, so obviously he got past that. But um, show the love of people, the love of Jesus. You know, if, if you can't afford it, order something less expensive so you can tip better. Okay. Um, but yeah, don't don't tell someone you care about them and then not show care. But yeah, something that simple. Just is there something we can pray for you about? And you'd be amazed because a lot of times they're carrying all kinds of burdens. And for someone to just, I, I mean, amazing stories come out of that. Um, and, and be willing to even to follow up on that. Remember, write, write it down. So the next time you go in there, note their name and say, hey, how's it going? Keep, like, keep praying. Oh, yeah. and, and when you say, I'm going to pray for you, I'll be praying for you, do that. Write it down. Make a note. I've got an app on my phone that I can put in prayer requests. And when I pray, I pull that out and, and I go through and, um, and I make a note. I stop to pray for people. And, um, and, and so, yeah, then you can come back and say, you know, I've been praying for you. How's it going? And that's showing love right there. And it's showing Christ-centered love. And it can be huge. Um, and so, but yeah, uh, just show them the kingdom. Show them that, that Christ is for us today. He sets us free today. Um, and don't just get hung up on heaven. Like People who've seen the movies, they have ideas about what heaven looks like. Most of them aren't all that interested. All right? This is... Uh, on Twitter, this uh, past week, many ex-evangelical kids, evangelicals that have left, grew up seeing their parents as mediators and mouthpieces between themselves and the angry deity. And she kind of went on. This was, I, I came across this because a news person that I followed um, retweeted this cop, like, sent it out there again. And, uh, and so I saw this. And, and she went on in and, and, and follow-up ones and said, Oh, that's, you know, it was, yeah, funny how, and there was, like, it started, it was this whole conversation with people saying, no, you ever notice how, how parents, when, when they say, oh, God says that you're supposed to do this, it's always what your parents want, <laughs> right? And, and really just a lot of venom. And it's, I've seen this too often. This is, see my response here. I see, I've seen this too often, a lot of teens at our church, and I tagged our church. I was a little nervous about that. But I thought, well, whatever, I'll put it in there. Um, had bad experiences or got kicked out of other churches, wish more experience the love instead. Right? She she liked my thing. I didn't have a follow up. Right? But it's somebody that doesn't know me. So I wasn't really expecting that she was gonna go, Oh, tell me more. 
Okay, but at the same time, she, someone who's had only negative experiences with Christianity, just found someone saying, you know what? There's love there, too. And, it, and she paused enough to say, huh. Cool, yeah. I'd like to see more of that. All right? Which opens the door for other people to come into her life. So it's, it's showing love. Just going out of your way for people, just letting them know the love of Jesus and not getting hung up on their works. I mean, it's, it's so goofy how, um, how we're centered in the gospel and, and God's love for us, and, and, and yet we can so much see ourselves as the lost son in the parable, when we're really the older brother, going, whoa. I've been at this. I, what really grinds my gears is when I hear somebody in a voters meeting or something like that say, well, I've been a member of this church for X number of years. And that when they say that, it implies that somehow their say has more weight than somebody else's. Guess what? If you've been a member for that many years, then that means that you should be more mature and more concerned about the needs of other people instead of your own preferences. Head you. So. Okay. so, things to remember. It's the Holy Spirit, it's not you. Don't ever feel guilty about someone not coming to faith. Don't ever beat up yourself and say, if only I'd said this or I'd done it this way. Right? Because it's not you. God works through broken sinners. I... I for a long time, I struggled with, right, God, why did you send sinners with the Great Commission instead of angels? Because, like, they're perfect. They could have just the right things to say. But you know what? You know what I can tell people? I can tell them about forgiveness. I can tell them firsthand what it is to be forgiven. I can tell them about the grace of God because I've experienced it, because I need it. And I can give them example after example after example of how God has shown his love to me when I didn't deserve it. I'll never run out of examples. And guess what? That's what they need too. But the Holy Spirit uses broken people to bring salvation. It's worked pretty well over the past couple thousand years. Right? Trust God. Be patient. Don't give up. Not everybody has a Damascus Road experience. It's okay to say, I don't know. I already said this, but it needs to be emphasized. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to have the right answers. You can even have the wrong answer and then come back later and say, you know what? You asked me this question. And I answered this way, and you were really put off by my answer, and rightly so, because I was wrong. You know what it means to people when you say, I was wrong, you were right? Or, or just to, I mean, or, I did this to you, I'm sorry. I, should, I always emphasize that with parents. Apologize to your kids. They know you messed up, right? They're not stupid. So apologize to them when you mess up and ask for their forgiveness. It's uncomfortable because it's vulnerable. Because you're putting yourself in their hands to decide what they're going to do with it. But man, forgiveness is powerful stuff. That's why we're here. So use it. Use it with your non-Christian friends to apologize. Be quick to apologize. Be quick to forgive. We're the church. You're not alone in this. We live in this individualized culture where we're so hung up on being able to do everything, to have it all and be everything to everyone. We can't. It's not us. We're not the Savior of the world either. Jesus is. We're the body of Christ. He brought us together. 
So sometimes when you say, I don't know, it's, I don't know, but let me introduce you to this person who knows the answers to this really well and can answer this a lot better. Or let me, um, let me go and talk to some people and find out and come back and get back to you on that. Right? Or if you don't know what to say, hey, you know what? I get together with some friends once in a while and, um, and I'd like you to meet them. And I think you'd like them. Give them a chance to belong. And culture is people. People is persons. Most people's platform is persons, not culture. Right? Unless you're Billy Graham. Well, if you're Billy Graham, you're not reaching anybody anymore. Anyway. All right? He's in heaven enjoying the fruits of his work. All right? But most of us are not going to reach thousands of people with the gospel. All right? We're not going to change the culture. But remember, there's a difference. I, I had to explain this to, um, <laughs> to a kid this week. The difference between people and persons. People is a group. It's actually singular. A people. Right? But a people is made up of persons. Right? Most of us, our platform, our, our sphere of influence is individual persons that God has brought into our life. And so I need you to be you to that person. All right? And, and if you mess up, if it goes back to Queen Esther, where Mordecai says, if you don't do it, then God will send someone else. But maybe you were put in a position for such a time as this. All right? There's, uh, maybe you've heard this where uh, God, you know, Jesus comes, ascends into heaven and, and the angels are like, so what's the plan? And he says, I'm, I'm, I sent them out and, and they're going to spread the gospel. And the, and the angels are like, people, huh? What's plan B? And Jesus says, there's no plan B. All right. And unfortunately, that's been used in times to like pressure people. If you don't do it, nobody will. No. So God will send someone else, because he loves that person. He'll send somebody else. Wouldn't it be cool if it was you? Or maybe you're the somebody else because of somebody else. Right? This is a joy that we have. This is love that God has given to us to share with others. And um, and it's a cool opportunity, and sometimes we're going to do it right, and sometimes we're going to do it wrong. And sometimes we think we're doing it right, and we find out later we did it wrong. Sometimes we think, oh, I, I messed that up so bad. And then the person calls us up the next day and says, I was really thinking about it. Tell me more. You never know. But God's a big God, and he's a powerful God, and he is a loving God. And he works through his word. It won't return to him empty. And so we share the gospel. So, some take-home exercises. I already mentioned the one. Go out to eat. Okay? Offer to, to pray for your server. If they say no, it's fine, you know? And maybe they will. Usually they don't. If they say no, it's not because of you. All right? Don't, don't be offended if they say no. All right? Pray the media. Um, pray the media means that you, wherever you get your news from, TV, newspaper, social media, whatever. Okay. Um, as you read each article, think about um, how would this story be different if those involved were free in Christ? What would have been different if these people, not just were Christians, because there's plenty of people that are Christians in the media that are, there's still problems going on, right? Okay, but what if they were free in Christ? What if they knew that freedom? Would things be different in the story? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay, but ask that question. And then pray for them. 
pray for the people in those stories and ask God whether he's calling you to act. You know, when you when you pray the Lord's Prayer, we'll get to it um, actually next. But, um, well, I'm stuck here too. We call praying the Lord's Prayer in a week. All right. Think about the Lord's Prayer. If you read the um, properly understood, um, I've, I've said that if you pray the Lord's Prayer and it doesn't move you to act, you're doing it wrong. All right. Because in the Lord's Prayer, we pray. If you look at the even the small catechism definitions, we pray in this petition that it would be done among us also. All right. Hallowed be Thy name, God. I want Your name to be. Your name is holy. Without my prayer. We pray in this petition to be kept holy among us also. God, let my life glorify your name. All right? And you, you go down the list, and every one of those in some way is, is really is saying, God, change my life. All right? And so this idea of Lord's Prayer in a week is Lord's Prayer has seven petitions. Pray one petition each day over and over. Not just like, you know, rosary bead kind of thing. Okay. But throughout the day, set a reminder for yourself. Set a, a, a one hour timer on your phone. And then when that goes off, hit reset. So it starts over again. And every time it goes off, pray that petition and, 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 and ask God and then, and keep your eyes open. And then do a different petition each week. And if and if you want to know more, um, read the small catechism definition. Read Luther's large catechism stuff. He doesn't spend as much time in the Lord's Prayer as he does on some other stuff in the large catechism, but it's good stuff. Right? Um, and um, and then and and do that not just for a week. Do that for three months. See what happens. You'll be changed by the end of it. All right? Now, these are just, I'm not telling you you have to do these things, okay? Understand that? All right? Because um, faith does not dictate how people live out their faith. That's Phariseeism. All right? That's not the gospel. But these are exercises that we can do to help us and strengthen us, to get us more connected with God's Word. Um, prayer walk your neighborhood. All right. How this works is you just go for a walk in the neighborhood. All right. If you got somebody to walk with, great. All right. And what you do is you walk through the neighborhood and you keep your eyes open. All right. You see, well, this neighbor's yard, they've got, there's, uh, you know, children's playthings in the yard. They've got kids. Pray for the parents. That they'd be able to show God's love to those children. Pray for the children that God would watch over them, keep them safe, that they would experience God's love. Right? You see someone that's got a pink ribbon outside their, um, oh, there's someone who's touched with cancer. Pray for that family. Right? Look at each house and, and what can you glean just from the house? Right? And if, if there's nothing that you can gather, then just say a general prayer that they would experience God's love. Right? And do that and walk through your neighborhood and pray for each of those people. Right? If you see someone coming out of the house or in their yard or something like that, say hello. Right? Be friendly. Get to know your neighbors. I have uh, something that I, I've been meaning to do. It's on my list of things to do. Um, you can go online to like whitepages.com will let you do this um, and get your neighborhood. If you don't know all your neighbors, um, and you can, uh, it'll tell you the names of all of your neighbors. A little creepy, but <laughs> there it is. All right. So then what you can do is you can start to learn their names. Now, don't just walk up to somebody that you've never met and call them by name. It's creepy. Okay. But what you can do is you can introduce yourself. And they tell you their name. And you might be thinking, yeah, I know. Okay. But maybe not, because you might have the wrong person in the household, right? 
Okay. But then that'll help you remember that. So the next time you see me, call him by name. And you know, calling people by name is huge. It's connection, and they'll be much more, um, much more open to you, right? And make a point of, of continuing to pray for people. If, if someone's yard is a mess, all right, it's probably a sign that they're kind of overwhelmed. There's so much going on in their life that they don't have time for a keep of their yard. So pray for them accordingly. Don't judge anyone. Okay, so uh, next up, we'll get to Q and A in a minute. Um, <clears throat> but uh, just some suggested media you have um, on your handout. There's a bunch of different things: um, books, blogs, video, audio. Um, just a whole ton of resources, and this is just scratching the surface of the stuff that's out there. Um, and uh, So I won't go through the, the whole list. Uh, I'll point out a couple things. Um, uh, one of, the, the first one on the books list, it's, it's downloadable, it's free, um, and it really captures how this works, a, a church in, in Cleveland uh, or outside of Cleveland that has taken this whole missional concept and, um, and taken it to the next level. I love the stuff that they're doing there. Um, and uh, it's got some just really simple ways that you can reach out to people in love. Um, uh, I mentioned at Stetzer before, breaking the missional code is a, um, becoming a missionary in your community. Um, that's a, a great one that kind of lays it all out. Um, this next one, Joining Jesus on His Mission, is one that I haven't read yet. Um, but I've met the author, and I've read a lot of his stuff. And it was given to me as a gift, and I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, and uh, and so I can, just knowing the author and, and having had conversations with him, um, I can recommend it. And and anything, he's got a blog that's listed down below, too. Or, yeah, oh, I just listed his name, you can Google him. Um, the Tangible Kingdom by Hugh Halter, somebody else that I've, I've heard him speak. He's an amazing guy. Um uh, missional Renaissance. Uh, Reggie McNeil. Uh, he takes it a little far. He says, "Well, we should get rid of pastors." <laughs> now, I understand that if if I could do my job and and be like a bivocational pastor, if we could get the church to the point where I can work half time and go like spend the rest of my time working for like a temp agency and just going all different places, I would love that. Okay. Um, We've got a ways to go before we get there. Um, but I, I do think that it's important to still have um, educated pastors. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's going to be stuff in some of these resources that I'm not necessarily going to agree with. I can't I can't just, you know, whole hog give you all this stuff. Unfortunately, there's just not a lot of Lutheran stuff out there um, that I can recommend. Um, so we're lagging a bit. Um, the... Uh, live like a local missionary, or live as a local missionary list. You see on the back of every bulletin, you'll see um, every Sunday there's a note that says live as a local missionary. Um, there's actually a complete list uh, that Heather's drawing that from. Um, it's got about 100 different ideas on it. Um, and if you ever want that complete list, let me know, and I'll send you a link to the Google Doc. I'll print it out for you if it's easier for you. Um, uh, 3DM is, that's Mike Breen, that's that thing I was talking about in England. Um, they're also, they've got local stuff here, right here in the Twin Cities and that too. Um, and so I've, I've talked to some of their people here, uh, really good stuff. Verge Network is, they've got a ton of ebooks, videos, uh, just all kinds of resources free. You, you, uh, create a, a free uh, login and um, tons and tons of stuff. Uh, just and good, good stuff. Uh, I already mentioned Hugh Halter. There's the link to his blog. Uh, Lutheran Society for Missiology. Um, I was able to find one good Lutheran resource, and actually I've, they published an article um, that I wrote uh, about a year or so ago. Um, they asked me to talk about Disciple Quest and 
Um, and so I did. Uh, but they've got some good stuff. And, um, and also, if you haven't heard of this, uh, it's an, an app for your smartphone uh, called the Hands and Feet app that KTIS, the local Christian station, produces. It's really great. And uh, even if you don't listen to the radio station or whatever, uh, it's a great app that just has tons of different ideas and how you can share God's love with people in your community. I was really impressed. Um, I have it on my phone. Um, under video, right now media, we have free subscriptions. If you don't have one yet, let us know and we'll get you set up. And uh, you just go in there and you search the word missional and you'll find lots of different conference videos and, and Bible studies and all kinds of stuff. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the, your, your keyword that you're looking for that covers this kind of stuff that we're talking about. Um, uh, the Soma community, uh, is, uh, it's a church, uh, that's doing some really great work. Uh, I mentioned Virgin Network again. I, I just can't say enough good things about them. Um, the Exponential podcast, uh, exponential.org is, um, it's actually a church planting resource. Um, but a lot of the stuff they're talking about, you know, as a church planner that goes into a community and shares the love of Christ to plant a church. Um, and that stuff works if you're not trying to plant a church too. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, and they, one of the things that, that I, I think I, I got from them at, at some point, um, but I firmly believe is that if you, If you plant a church, you might get disciples. If you make disciples, you will get a church. That's an important distinction. Because the church needs to be the church. It needs to be the body of Christ. Um, not Bubble Creek King. Um, and the sixth podcast uh, is a friend of mine that's a uh, pastor of a big Missouri City mega church down in uh, in. Uh, St. Louis, and um, but he did this podcast. He started it when he was at a church in Michigan, and continued it down there. Hasn't done anything with it for a while, but there's a lot of uh, episodes that are still out there. Little audio things, like 15 minutes a piece, um, that just have all kinds of stories and, and thoughts and things on on dealing with different issues. Uh, some of it's a little bit dated now because he hasn't done, but because he talks about some current events and stuff. But a lot of it's still <laughs> applicable and, and will as. Um, things tend to happen again and again. Um, very applicable, good stuff. Um, and the guy that does Dion Garrett, is a phenomenal preacher too. I, it's one of the pastors that I listen to every week. So, um, uh, and then um, Disciple Quest mission. You have it in your attachments. Um, so Disciple Quest is, first of all, I should, I should just talk about that for anyone that's not familiar with it. Disciple Quest is a uh, where I took the, this concept of making disciples and, and turned it into a kind of loose curriculum. Um, that it's, it's designed to be one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Anyone is interested in doing that, this is actually a good place to start for, for most of you, is the, um, the missional outreach it's, it's divided up into a bunch of primary missions. They focus on different uh, concepts within Christianity. And, um, and so mission outreach is one of them. And the way that you'll see there's different paths. is the warrior's path and the scholar's path and stuff. And the idea here is that different people learn in different ways. And so, um, and so what you do is you, you look at each step along the way and you pick a path. And you find the one that appeals to you the most. And, and you do that, and I'll walk with you through it and, and work with you. And I've had some people do this, and it's been really helpful to them. And, um, and so you find the one, and, and yeah, I'll, I'll help you through it. It's not just like, all right, go do it, all right? Um, but it's designed to, to work together on it. And, um, and so, so you, you do that, and you complete that step, and you go on to the next one. And um, I, I was doing this with, um, with my daughter Hannah on a, a different um, mission, and and, and she goes, well, can I do two different ones? Because I can't choose. I said, no. <laughs> no, I, you know, so if, if there's several of them that appeal to you, great. You know, and so this, the idea is these are ideas. It's, it's a starting point. Um, and uh, 
And so take a look at that. If you're interested in that, I'd love to sit down with you and talk to you more about it. Um, and then that leads to the end of that. The, the final thing you see on there is commission local missionary. All right. And the idea is that, that after you, you're received more training than what I'm able to do in my sort of rapid fire thing today, um, to have that, that mentoring is to learn to be able to go out to, to mentor others and, and further, uh, education and, and learning and growing in this whole concept of, of sharing your faith in where you're at. Um, and actually saying, sort of picking a, um, a specific place where you see that there's a lot of people that don't know Jesus that where you see, you know what, God has sent me to this place and, and to, to essentially to send you out like a missionary to that place um, and, and train you and equip you and, 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 and help you through that. And, um, and so this, the missional outreach uh, mission is basically the training to become a commission local missionary. Um, I understand, I, I was nervous about this kind of stuff that, hey, well, if I don't do that, am I not a good Christian or something? Right? There's no such thing as a good Christian, right? <laughs> and, and we all, again, it's Phariseeism to say you have to do this, that, or the other thing. Okay. This is an opportunity. This is an invitation that if this is something that appeals to you, then let me know and I'll help you out with it. Okay. If it's not, if you see God's leading you a different direction, great. Okay. Um, and, and you're not, <laughs> you're not better <laughs> than somebody else because we're all broken sinners. And, um, so, and then the other thing is to be, uh, to the disciple quest training to, um, which means to to say I want to not just the the missional outreach mission I want to do the whole ball of wax, um, and because there's there's nine different primary missions, and and they cover um, who God is and and how we relate to Him, the um, how how to to get the most out of the sacraments and um, uh, how to. It just kind of it goes through and, and all these different concepts. It's actually built on a small catechism, um, but it's it's digging deeper into those things and it follows the same kind of idea of these different paths. And you find the one that works best for you. I found people that um, it's been a long time since they've been in confirmation class, um, looking for something uh, a little deeper than what we're able to do in a um, ten session DDD class. Um, to, to really dig into the stuff and grow, especially because it's personalized, it's how it relates to you um, individually and your particular context, your particular abilities, your particular learning style, all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in that, let me know, and I would love to work with you on that. And the idea here is that if you get enough people that go through this that are trained in this stuff, you're trained to train. <laughs> and so going back to that initial thing about disciples making disciples, right? That's the concept that this is built on. And um, you don't need to go through disciple quest to be a disciple who makes disciples. All right? It's one way to do it. I found for Lutherans, we like structure. <laughs> this is like the liturgy version of, um, you know, of, of discipleship. Right? Um, and I found that it was designed uh, specifically for Lutherans. Um, but it was also designed in mind with that other churches could take this concept and, and use it for other things too. So, all right. I was really rapid fire, but I've been kind of watching the clock and um, I wanted to get through as much as possible. And I also recognized that even while I was laying in bed last night, I was like, oh, I need to add that. I need to include this. And, and, and I realized just looking at this, it's, I already skipped some of the things that some of the notes that I had on here that I was going to include, and I realized, oh, I'm way past that now. Okay, well, <laughs> let's keep going. So, questions? Yeah. I'll bring up something. I don't know if it's a question or maybe kind of a challenge. Um, you talked earlier about, like, one of the advantages you have is, like, you love playing Dungeons and Dragons, and you kind of, like, have this natural, like, place to interact with people who weren't necessarily like churchy Christians, right? Mm -hmm. Or churchy at all. A lot of us were brought up, we went, we're Lutheran, right? And there's like 
Lutheran school, and we helped pay for kids to go to Lutheran school, and we were brought up in the church, and we were brought up in a Lutheran school, and like, which of my friends aren't Christians? It's like, um, well, there's, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. not really, but, right. you know, we're, we're, I feel like a lot of us here are very not like that. <laughs> You're saying, okay, be who you are, which might mean you love Dungeons and Dragons, and that's okay, and whatever, but, Okay, so some of us, we like choral music, and <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're kind of the nerds of the world, right? So how does that work for us? Or does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I hear what you're saying. All right. So um, so a couple things. First of all... I'm uh, saying, sorry. Yeah. I, we can't relate to some people very well. Uh-huh. Does that make sense? All right. So, so first of all, I think about those places. All right. Um, to talk about kind of the beginning, right? And if you don't have those places, and, and you know all your friends are, are Christians or whatever, right? right? You're then you're like most Christians, okay? Um, so so first of all, meetup.com, right? Um, is a great place to to find people nearby uh, that, and and it'll go through and it'll be like, what are your interests? And it'll it'll like sort of ask you, uh, how about this? Here's lists to pick, and you go, yep, that one, that one, that one, all right. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is to recognize that not everybody that's connected with the church is a Christian, right? And and it may be that um, that even in Christian groups or groups that are mainly populated with Christians, that you've got people that are really hung up on the law, and uh, and and God's giving you the opportunity to connect with those people. And um, and to help them experience God's freedom in the gospel, that they don't, you know, they they think of themselves as Christians, and they may, you know, I you know, I'm not going to look at any particular person and say, well, that person is, and that person they they believe enough, or they believe the right things about Jesus, or whatever. Okay, um, <clears throat> I've met some Mormons that know more about grace than a lot of the things that I know. Okay, um, and I thought, well, I'm not sure how that works, and glad I don't have to make the call on that. Okay. But um at the same time, uh, you know, so so that may be the opportunity. All right. But you'd be amazed with, you know, just even think about like what games you like to play or, or something like that. I mean it could be something as simple as if you like card games, board games, uh particular kind of music. Um you know, there's there's lots of stuff out there. Um and uh and yeah, you know, if you like organ music Chances are, most of the people that um, that you get together with that like organ music, they probably attend a church somewhere because <laughs> they like organ music. Um, but you know, I mean, there may be other things too. And so, so some of that is is taking some time to pray, and sometimes the opportunity presents itself that you weren't expecting to. So that it goes back to praying and being open, and and looking for those opportunities. Um, and I found that also that as, as terrible as social media is, um, that we can be a light there. Um, you know, one of the things that one of the stories I forgot to include that I thought of last night, thank you for the opportunity, um, is that there's groups online that I've met that, um, that have, that are populated with lots of people that aren't Christians, right? And the, the, around a common interest. And there was this group that I was connecting with, and, and you know, it led to all kinds of really cool faith conversations and stuff. And then uh, I just got busy with stuff, and and I drifted away from that group. And then I was talking to, uh, it was actually another pastor that um, I had mentioned this group to him a while back, and, and the cool conversations I was having there and stuff. He's like, how's that going? I'm like, oh, man, it's been like a year since I, hey, you know what? This was a mission field that, that I was in, and and I walked away from it. Hey, I got to go back there, and I went back, and and things were a little bit different, but um, just in the time that I'd been gone. But um, there were people there that remembered me and stuff, and it was a pretty quick welcome back. And and you know that that group, that online group, the website where people hung out, isn't there anymore. Um, but th- those people. I am Facebook friends with most of them nowadays, and I have really cool conversations with them all the time about all kinds of stuff. 
and a lot of times faith conversations. And um and it's and well I can't think of that any of them have gone from not being Christians to being Christians. I know a lot of them have gone from being really hostile to Christianity that now they're like well, not all Christians are like that. There's some you know when 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 Christianity is and you know to the point where I'll post Christian stuff sometimes and they'll like it, you know, like yeah, that's I'm really happy to see you posting that or they'll they'll make positive comments about it and stuff like that. And so just just having the opportunity, and then I, I pray for them all the time and, and pray that God will will send people into their lives to um, you know to to water that seed rose kind of. Um, so. There's not an easy answer to that, but there are resources and um, ways to, to find people. And yeah, so some of it's just figuring out who you are and who you are. And it is one thing. Other questions? Please do. I don't know. Um, so, and maybe this is, I don't know, these aren't so much just questions like, okay, answer this. It's more of like discussion mm-hmm. and stuff. But like, the people who I know, a lot of my, and you posted something on Facebook not too long ago. I started writing something and then I got distracted. I never responded, but it was something about, um, like the working class, um, what was it, Lord? I tried to it was like we don't we don't evangelize the working class. You know what I mean? Oh. Mm-hmm. We do mm-hmm. not like because they don't have money. They don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah, there's like, um like the tendency of of modern churches all want to look like coffee shops. Yes. Um, but once you get below a certain income level, um, people aren't comfortable in coffee shops because. It's sort of like, um, okay, so we've been watching the um, the Olympics. We just watched the closing ceremonies last night, all right, because um, we've been watching it on demand. And there's a lot of stuff that even we don't watch everything, like curling. I don't get that. But um, but there's, you know, it's, it's taken us a while to get through it. And, and so we've been watching it on the NBC Sports app on our Apple TV. And, and it's sponsored by the Golf Channel. Right. Well, I've never gotten into golf, and the reason I've never gotten into golf is because it was a rich man's game. Golf and skiing. Right. I can never afford it. Oh, and hockey. Right. So I don't fit in real well in Minnesota. I don't get it because what do poor people do in Minnesota? I don't know. Okay, curl on my guess. They go somewhere else. <laughs> Shovel plow. Yeah, right. Um, they go somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> um. So. But when I was growing up, I couldn't afford to do those things, all right? Um, and, and so I had friends that were that played hockey. Hockey was a really big thing where I grew up in Wisconsin for the rich kids. And uh, for the poor kids, didn't play hockey, all right? So, yeah, we need to be careful as a, as a church that, that when we think about how do we reach out to people, that, and that, that comes down to getting to know people, and knowing where they're at, but also thinking about, you know, it can be something as simple as if someone has a, if their car is not in real good shape and they can't afford a, a nice car, right? And they, I don't know, maybe this is one of the advantages of having a small parking lot, but if they come and uh, and they see, like, the parking lot's full of Beamers and Lexuses and, and everything, that right there might, for some people, is going to be enough to go, I don't fit in here, right? Um, but yeah, just being aware of, of, you know, things as simple as, um, what is the dress code for that event? How should I dress for that? Um, and, and do I have nice enough clothes to come to that dinner? Um, and, uh, and that was, that was something that with the, the youth, right? Um, came, one of the kids came to, um, to our uh, Valley Fair, 
And um, you know, to, to kids at Valley Fair, kids brought friends. It's one of the things that the kids will come to pretty readily. Um, you know, and uh, and you know, we just treated them all like human beings. And they came back, and one of them, I went, "Hey, cool Black Sabbath patch on your jacket, Ozzy or Dio?" And and he went, "Huh?" <laughs> Because that was the jacket that got him kicked out of another church. But here the pastor actually knows something about the stuff that he's interested in and welcomed him and accepted him. And you know what? He's the one that's telling his friends, this is the coolest place ever. And he loves it here. And you know what? You know what? There's kids, like youth group members, here, that, especially the ones I don't see real often, that if I'm out in public and see them, they'll avoid me. They'll talk, oh, I'll see them do it, you know? I'm not going to chase them down and embarrass them, right? But some of these kids that, I mean, like, they're not even there with Jesus yet. They're the ones that, when they see me in public, hey, Pastor Dale, hey, this is, this is, this is a pastor of the church that I'm, you know, Right, and, and for them, it's because they don't have all that baggage. They don't see the expectation. This is a place where I'm loved and accepted. Man, if we could convey that without, without you know, but that Bubble Creek Canyon thing, right? This is another thing: is is lingo, and and well, if you're a real Christian, then you listen to Christian radio. Guess what? Christian radio is specifically targeted at soccer moms. Right? That's like, you listen with that in mind and you'll see it while well, you're here. Right? Um, just even the people that call in and what they play back and stuff like that. That's their target audience. Um, I, mean, I listen to it. Right? I like it. Yeah. I don't know this. But most of the people who are talking about something as Christian kind of think they're going to say that they want the answer to is why do good things happen to bad people? Why did these kids die here? Why did. And, and you know, and I don't know, certainly my answer is not, because I don't know, but I don't know like how. That's harder. It's not, I'm going to get back to you on that. Sure. There's probably no way to get back to yeah. you. Okay. Or what do you do? Well, the biggest problem with that question is that it's a really broad question, all right? So the first, the answer is, why do you want to know? Yeah, well, I mean, they, but they're probably in their question is say, I know the kids got, that got shot at Parkland. How could God let that happen? Sure. That's probably Okay, all right. So then we have, you say, yeah, the world's really messed up, isn't it? All right. And yeah, God allows these things to happen because he doesn't, you know, it's it's not like when, when someone's just about to do something bad that an axe appears out of nowhere and chops off their hand, right? It's actually by God's grace, his, his love for us, that he allows those things to happen, um, which sounds weird, okay? But that if God struck us down every time we were going to do something hurtful to somebody else, there'd be nobody left. But on the other hand, he gives us the opportunity to love in those situations, right? And to um, to take those situations. And um, I, one speaking of Christian radio, one of the songs I really love, um, I just heard it again yesterday, is um, called "Do Something." Our puppet troupe did a a, um, a puppet thing based on that, and uh, and he says, "God, why don't you do something?" And he said, "I did. I created you." And, and so, by God's mercy, he allows this suffering to happen, all right? He's promised that it will come to an end. But meanwhile, he's given us the opportunity to show, to show his love in those situations, all right? And, and God does bring good from those. Um, I mean, look at, you know, in, in, in my lifetime, the big defining moment was 9-11, all right? And I look at that, and I look at, you know what? As terrible as that is, 
God has brought a lot of positive out of that. And especially right afterward, man, it, what a wake-up call it was to us as a nation. That all of the petty things that were going on, all of a sudden, everybody went, whoa, none of that stuff matters. All right, and it didn't take long before we were back to it again. All right, but for a little while, we actually cared about each other. And I agree with everything you say, but if I'm talking to this person who's also because of this thing that happened, I probably react to this, if you say those things to that hospital person, Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. How do you think you, how do they react? They respond in different ways because I've done it. Yeah. And, um, and, yeah, and that's the reality. And I mean, the other thing is, um, oh, uh, Ravi Zacharias, brilliant guy, listen to him, it's good stuff. Um, he, uh, he, he addresses this question. He says, you know, people ask, why is there evil in the world? Right? And, <clears throat> he says, for you to ask that question, you're assuming that there's some basis to define what is evil and what's not. Right? What's wrong with a bunch of kids getting shot up? Right? We all go, that's bad. What's your basis for that? Right? By what, uh, how do you determine what's good and what's bad? Right? There is a sense of good and bad that we have, that everyone has. Now, for everybody, it's a little bit different. Right, but overall, we have a kind of a sense of these things are good, these things are bad. Right, and um, and so if there is some kind of moral law that we say that action was bad, then that moral law has to come from somewhere. That there must be a moral law giver, and then if that's the case, it's a question of who is that giver. But the good news is that we believe that it's a God who loves us in spite of all of us breaking that law in various ways. Right? And you can also, you know, you can also talk about it's getting back to pointing out your own failings. Um, you know, I can say, you know, I can think of ways that I've been hurtful to my wife, to my kids, to, you know, other people, all the things that I've done in my life. And, um, and man, I'm glad there's forgiveness. And, um, to bring it back to that. So, I mean, it's such a complicated question. It's sort of like saying, it, it's like, and, and you can, you can address it this way too. I mean, people, you know, use specifics and that's helpful, but, uh, the other thing is, it's sort of like saying, I'm looking for a cure for cancer or a cure for the common cold. Well, you're talking about a lot of different diseases that we've just sort of all lumped together under one category. There's no one cure. Some cancers have been cured, right? They have treatments that are 90% effective, right? But there's other ones where, I mean, they can barely touch it because they're different, right? And the same with the, the common cold. There's no such thing, right? Um, you know, what, what my wife has and what I had are probably two different things, okay? Um, And so it is with the evil in the world, is that, well, which one are you talking about, right? And the other thing is we don't, we can can say, well, it could be this, it could be that. Um, But we can also say, I like to use the illustration that um, when a magician pulls a rabbit out of a hat, um, you know that rabbit was in it was there's a false bottom to the hat or something like that that allowed him to pull it out. But you know it was there to begin with, right? Our God is big enough, he's straight, he's powerful enough, and he's loving enough that God can reach into a bad situation and pull good out of it where there was none. He can miraculously pull good out of a bad situation. And, and so he allows those bad things to happen. You know, the, the Tower of Siloam fell, um, and if you went, well, who sinned? That, that caused that to happen. And Jesus says, what, you think you're better than that? <laughs> and um, so I was like, Jesus, that was kind of rude, right? But that was his answer, so he must know what he's talking about because he's God. And, um, and so 
you know, I mean, that was, Jesus never had to say, why do you want to know? He didn't. Um, but we recognize that he says this happened that, um, for God's glory. And that God can take those bad situations and bring good out of them that is better and, and, and the, the good is so much better than the bad that happened. And sometimes we can't see it and there's some things that we're not going to be able to really understand until we're standing face before face-to-face before God. Um, but we believe that. Just by the time we get. Um, to me, what's happened in the last 30 years is that secular culture has sort of eliminated Christianity as a moral code. Mm-hmm. That it's become different. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I will say I've been accused of this question. But the feeling is you're, you're, I mean, I have been out of but you're out of touch. Uh, you're, you teach things that are untrue. Obviously, if this person feels an identity is that this way, who should I have? You should be And it's, I find it very hard to, besides just say, well, it's what I believe in. You know, <laughs> I, I don't get very um, patient. Yep. All right. So. Is there um, aggressive? It's become aggressive. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So welcome to the first century. Because we're back to pretty much where Christianity started. And you look at Rome. Rome was actually worse. All right. They had public baths. And those public baths were not used for getting clean. Well, they were that. But they were pretty dirty too. All right. There was, I mean, sexuality in our culture is nowhere near. I mean, the temples were places where they hired, you know, they had a thousand prostitutes on staff. That was part of the culture, all right? We're nowhere near that. And um, were you going to say something? I would make the, okay, because I have, I have a, a contingent of friends who are um, definitely not in And one of my, I have one friend who's Jewish who said at one point, how hard it, it has been to be Jewish. I, I think where when I hear people, you know, Christians say, well, you're not, you're not the time is changing. I get it. I get it. I grew up in it. But I think what, what we're missing as Christians is we forced a bunch of stuff on people in ways that were in sometimes cruel. And they're reacting to it. And they, they're saying, you've got you Christians who have been telling us this is wrong, yeah, but what are you going to do? You know, because I, I, just, I, I still remember this, this Jewish friend of mine, he's very clear, he's like, and her parents, her parents were in, in Auschwitz. So, you know, she is so, she's, she's culturally Jewish. She is, she's, she, she had a wedding to rabbi and didn't come out. And that's kind of stretch. She's like, how hard it is to live a life if you're non christian yeah. She grew up in New York. So, I kind of go, I hear that statement, and I think it's true. I also think that we have to recognize, as Christians, our, our culpability in that. Or that, you know what? We have been hurried. We have been aggressive. What our norms were were the norms, and now that's changing. And I think we, we made the point back in the beginning, the, the long about, um, it was pretty early on. I think we have, to, we have to recognize that when people say those, say those things back to us, they're not talking to us particularly. They're talking to all the baggage that we has come before. Yeah. Uh, this is, um, you know, we live in a post-church culture. And, um, but you know what? You know where Christianity thrives the most? Is actually where the church is persecuted. And that's actually what we need. All right. As much as I really don't want to preach from prison. All right. Um, man, over in China, the projections are that they're baptizing twenty to thirty thousand people a day, and and they're using discipleship. They're not. It's not this sort of. Um, you know, blanket, reaching a thousand people at a time, baptize them, and then they walk away. It's this one-on-one discipleship, right? Um, and uh, 
and and they're I mean they're facing all kinds of persecution. They have to do it in secret. They they go out into the woods um, for on to worship at different times each week, and and they they've got it worked out so that not everybody gets there at the same time. It's not you don't have this mass exodus of where are all these people are going. They schedule it out over the, of several hours um, so that nobody notices and stuff like that. And the church is thriving. All right, and in fact, I often say that it's. I think it's a good thing. Some of the stuff that we're seeing happening with the culture, in that, for one, you don't have cultural Christians anymore. All right, it used to be that, like, like if you wanted to be a successful politician, you had to show up in church. All right, and that's not true anymore. All right, and so we don't have people in church saying that they're Christians when they're really not. Right? The mission field is so much clearer now. Right? And, and also remember that it's not about behavior. Right? Don't try to, you know, I, I try to avoid those questions, those cultural questions. I mean, you can't always, and it's not that I'm afraid of them, but the problem is, is there's so much baggage tied up in that stuff that, again, a lot of it doesn't make sense until you recognize freedom in Christ. And, um, and so, so, yeah, I mean, there's, we need to, as Christians, recognize the difference between persecution and loss of privilege. Um, and there's a lot of things that we get really uptight about that are actually, that we're just not in, we don't have the power that we used to have. We still have quite a bit, though. Um, you know, even in the last presidential election, um, President Trump became a Christian along the way. I'm not going to say whether, I don't know whether it was legitimate or not. All right. I don't. And I'm not going to say, nah, you're faking it. All right. I know that there are people in his life, but it was a convenient time. That before that he said, I've never apologized to God about it. So I, you know, I don't know. So we still, it's still pretty hard to be an atheist, um, in our culture and, and get, you know, public, uh, support. So yeah, I mean, and sometimes the outreach in those situations is, yeah, you know, must be really hard for you in this culture that where you have, um, where, where Christians are in power and you're the minority. And, and acknowledge that and see things, meet them where they're at and see things from their standpoint. Um, man, I've learned so much hanging around with, um, with people that from just all different backgrounds and stuff like that and seeing how they see the world through a lot of them. And um, but that's also giving the opportunity to, um, to share the gospel because once you once you can get to where they're at and see things, then you see how the gospel applies in their situation. I had I just want to finish this because I understand that part. I was impressed. But I have had a friend of mine and he knows the Christian. It's just the problem is you think homosexuality is bad. And I don't have an answer for it. I certainly can't say no, I think it's good. So, so, um, think of people as people, right? And, and, um, different people see the world in different ways. People, different people have different struggles, right? What I can often say is that, um, that, you know, I, I, here's what I know. I know that in, in our world, that even though there's a lot of uh, sort of um, LGBT rights stuff and all that kind of stuff, you know, I've got a lot of gay friends that it's still really hard for them. They still deal with a lot of persecution, right? And and we're not talking about rights, we're talking about them getting treated terribly, like no human being should be treated, right? So we need to identify with that. And we even need to make a point of, of owning that. And saying, you know what? And I know that the Christian church has been a big part of that problem. And I'm really sorry about that. So is the way to just sort of avoid what, and I don't mean that negative, I mean, um, to have no opinion. 
You don't want to ask that. I wouldn't ask, is that a sin? Sure. What, what I say is, you know what? I, I believe that there are some things that are going to lead to um, to more to a lot of long term problems for people. But also, I, you know, I, I recognize that um, that that these things are challenges for people. Um, it's a struggle, and um, you know, whenever possible, what I want to do is is I want to say, you know what? Um, tell me where you come from. Tell me what you believe. Tell me where you're at. Tell me what your struggles are, all right? And I want to walk with you through that. Help me to see things from your perspective. I'm not necessarily going to agree with you, all right? The more we listen, the more people are willing to listen to us, all right? And don't listen just so that you have the opportunity to speak. Listen so that you have the opportunity to understand. Um, the opportunity is coming. You know, that's, and that goes back to that whole, be ready to give an answer, right, to those who ask, right? When people see Jesus in you, they'll ask. Some will, some won't. It's not like, oh, well, this person hasn't asked, what am I doing wrong? Okay. But the opportunities have come. Yeah. I just wanted to say, before you leave, I have a book for you. It's in my purse. And I was like, I want to give some of this to somebody at church to look over. It's a book. It's not in print yet. But it's by Julie Slattery, and um, and it addresses a lot of that. And I, I completely resonate with some of what Deb was saying because basically America was built. You know, they often say it's a Christian country. Well, you know, there was no hard coded into the like into the laws. But our laws were used to promulgate a certain lifestyle for a long time, and at the expense of freedom for people who. Um, you know, didn't fit that mold. Were they doing atrocities and murdering people? Or, you know, it's, it's this whole like, okay, to what extent do we, um, legislate morality? You know, and it, and it was kind of fair to say, and we have, we have some responsibility in that because we should be preaching to people's hearts, not to their behavior, just like you've been saying. And that's, that's where, you know, Doug was talking about kind of the anger that comes back in the lash back and the baggage. That people carry that anger against Christians for doing that. And we do, as a, a Christian, need to take some responsibility for, you know, yeah, my parents, they came up and it was like, this is how you have to be. And, and, and really, God didn't say that, though. You have to correct them. Like, God didn't say that. He was, and, and you can give examples from the Bible and stuff, and I won't let any of you tell But this book speaks about it. Now, now that it's another term, so there's the first term. That others are not legislating around. Well, that's the, that's the oh, thing. It's they always are. Been the case. Yeah. They are. But my wife says it's their turn now. Right, and that's exactly. And now people are like, oh, but wait, now I'm a libertarian, right? <laughs> and we have to really be thoughtful on what's happened in the past. That the, our name, not necessarily us personally, and not necessarily Christ, but our name as Christian is contributed to, and acknowledge it, and then correct it, you know? Okay, so I was just going to say, we're all Christians and all sins are equal. Like, the consequences are not equal, but the sin is equal. Me speeding down the street is equivalent to murder in God's eye. I mean, that's that's always where I can start with this argument. But I'd also make the argument that let's take it out of LGBT because that is something that we're in the midst of. And, you know, let's go to domestic abuse. 30, I had a friend 20 years ago, her pastor told her, you can't leave your husband even if you didn't up. That's against God's law. The church, we have to recognize that the church is flawed and how we execute God's law or God's love is flawed. And, and I think, like you said, we have to own up to it. And I think that's part of the, part of the outreach is say, when people complain about the church, it's like the church is made up of flawed human beings. The kingdom is God's kingdom. And God is perfect. And the church is brought in good, but, but there's many flawed human beings. So I think that's part of the equation is acknowledging that. Because if you don't, if, if we dig in our heels and say, we disagree with you, all it is is protect, we're not showing a love. We're saying, you're, we can't get over what you are. 
to say, he says, say, who do I love? Mm-hmm. And it's hard. It's, we're always going to say it. It's always going to be a push and pull. But. Well, I mean, I understand that. And I try, and I try to. What I, what I have problems with is I'm being required to celebrate stuff that I know is wrong, including some of this would say to me, do you think I'll be cheap? I'll be cheap because there's now 59 ideas um, that says that that's a sin. But, but how are you being asked to celebrate it? Are you being asked to, to walk in the pride for it? Like, like, yeah, I'm, being, I'm being asked whether I'm with the movements. Oh. And I've said, I'm not with anything, nor am I against anything like that. It's not for me to judge. Right. And that's a legitimate answer. And, and, and that's, if they don't take it the way you mean it, that's not on I mean. They don't believe it. I, you know, I find a lot of times that you can reframe the question, and that this is a, you know, say, here's what I believe. Right? I believe that God loves everyone. I believe that we all have different struggles. And um, and I believe that Jesus died for everyone. Everyone. Right? And I believe that salvation is not dependent on, um, on how you define yourself um, sexually. Right? Like this is, is it all goes back to starting with love. Right? I believe that that I haven't always acted that way, and um, and I and I believe that the church hasn't always acted that way, and and I'm sorry for that, and I ask your forgiveness. Right? But you know, you start there, and and I also you know I want to make sure that that wherever a person is at, that I want to show them love. I want to, I want to be there for them. I want to help them however I can. Right? And I may not always see the world the same way, but we all see the world in different ways. Right? That's not going to stop me from loving someone. If you see me not loving someone, not caring about someone, and looking out for their well-being, right? you call me on the carpet. Making yourself vulnerable and asking for forgiveness. And that's what it's all about. And that's, I mean, because a lot of those other kind of like, well, how do we deal with these cultural questions? Right? Those are culture questions. Yeah, I've noticed that, like, you look at, at what the world was like in the early Christian church, right? And while Paul. Mm-hmm made a point in his epistles to say, all right, this stuff, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. He's talking to the Christians. He did not say, go out and change the culture. Right? Because the culture is people and our platform is persons. Right? So what he said is, shine the light of Christ. Right? And so, so I've got, I tell you, I have friends that are, um, that have all different kinds of uh, attractions, identities, all that kind of stuff, right? And um, and I meet them where they're at. I care about them, and they'll ask me questions about what I believe. And once we've established a relationship, I can talk about it. And so I'm not, I'm not sure that, that this is beneficial, right? But it doesn't separate you from God's love. It doesn't change how the way I care about you, right? Um, and, and I also have people that used to be very close friends that, um, I've put my foot down on things that aren't my friends anymore that I deeply regret. And, um, and really wish that there's some way that I could get them to forgive me. So I'll start with love. We're way over time. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have an evaluation sheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the last page, you can just tear that off. Evaluation, um, just like leave them in a pile on 
table or something. <clears throat> yeah. That's a quick question. Like, can we do this again? Like, yeah. can we, but maybe, like, do some of the assignments and come back and talk about them or something? Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's people that said, hey, I can't be there. Yeah. You know, I want to be there. Um, this is an ongoing thing. So part of the evaluation questions are how we should proceed from here. Yeah. Can, can you also give us some of the more extended notes of things that you're showing up here? The points that you were making are here. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I can, I can make the PowerPoint available. Okay, I mean, that would be nice. I didn't have a second and I didn't write tests because I wanted to remember some of those things. Yeah, I'm not sure if when I distribute the PowerPoint, I don't think I can distribute the videos. Because, no. like, although some of those videos are on Right Now Media, you can find them on there. Yeah, no, a lot just, of them are. The rest are from YouTube, so. Just the point. But yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Stand up there the whole time. Yeah. That helps me not fall asleep. That's <laughs> <laughs> why pastors stand when they preach. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, oh, and I wanted to, I meant to do this at the beginning, and I also forget something. I want to thank the Evangelism Committee for all the work they did to put this together. Yes, thank really you. We didn't do a lot. Not the soul. He did it. <laughs> he did it, not us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Helen Pacheco showed up. Yeah. Oh, Helen made that? Oh, yes. Awesome. That's good. I like that. <laughs>